Hi guys, thank you for joining the live stream. I hope all my volume issues of with my mic is fixed today. Today we will be joined by uh, Mr. Abhas Malda here, an architect, a historian, a former commie, now a historian and apparently biographer of Babar. And he has been having many weird questions and going around answering many weird questions about <laughs> the sexuality of of Mughal emperors. So let's see, may, maybe we will <laughs> ask those questions to him today on our podcast as well. He's currently st- uh, stuck in traffic or probably has reached home and is probably getting ready by now. Uh, he'll join us when he can. Uh, before that, let me check some uh, comments. Uh, kuch vilamb ka abhas ho raha hai. Nice, nice. I see what you did there. Uh, channel ka naam College Street Kolkata kyu rakha apne? Because College Street Kolkata in Kolkata, that place called College Street Kolkata, is where all the um, uh, is n- known to ha- uh, occur all the uh, let's see that place is known to have the most numbers of academic things in kolkata at in one spot the the street is called college street because the, there are uh, the, the the calcutta medical college or some other medical college is right beside the presidency college and now presidency university but more importantly that entire street is filled with old books that you can't find anywhere else probably on earth so uh, it's it's an old book market as well plus any book you can possibly need for anything in academia all that is uh, there in college street kolkata only and as you can probably guess as is the case as is the scene with our academia in india uh, that place is is mainly filled with commies so i want to reclaim that place i want to reclaim that name anytime you hear college street kolkata uh, and you say that name in front of anyone in kolkata today they will think of yes great leftist intellectuals are the coffee houses also in college street kolkata uh, I wanted to mean something else completely in 5-10 years. I would like to go t- uh, to Malda with Babar's gay poems. <laughs> uh, it's a library on street, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, before before Abhasji comes on, uh, and by the way, those of you who want to check out his books, all the uh, uh, all his books are give, the links of the uh, books are given in the description box check them out he has written another book about one or two years back today we are mainly going to ask him about uh, his journey from being a leftist uh, to a non-left historian directly what was the process like and how does he manage manage and accommodate so much work in his life um and the other topic that i that i could not get into yesterday that was hilarious let's discuss that for a bit Although we would need to check that article fully uh, to in order to in order to get into that, but it was pretty uh, funny. Uh, an article on scroll by someone with a with a PhD in international relations, which is basically an advanced version of political science. In fact, in JU, uh, the the graduation course is called political science, but the same subjects master's course, I guess with obviously uh, interesting additions, is called inter- international relations. So that woman has done some course in uh, some some masters or PhD in I think LSE as well, London School of Economics, from where our Nupur Sharma, Ambedkar, Jawaharlal Nehru, all of these uh, people have uh, done done either masters or PhD from. So anyway, uh, she wrote an article uh, claiming that she she is very frustrated <laughs> with with the Indian Foreign Ministry, India's Foreign Minister, J. Sai Deepak, all these people who are apparently uh, using or plagiarizing. Yeah, I'll try to bring Anuzhar someday. They are plagiarizing left-wing uh, or, or let's say post-colonial lingo to suit their agenda. Well, uh, the, the fun part was that her article was mainly uh, 80% just rhetoric. There was nothing other than some ranting and rhetoric. 20% was pointing out specific things saying that, see, this is, wh- this is what they're saying and this is why it's wrong and this is wh- how it should be. That 20%, the criticism that she does make, it's written by someone called Kiran Huju. Uh, I'm talking about it because th- that article uh, in, in Scroll pretty much went viral in non-left Twitter circles in India. So the the three or four criticisms that she, that she actually makes, pointing some specific thing out, those are applicable to her own article anyway. Dada, have you checked Ambit's Savarkar study circle that JNU is hosting? No. I, I saw that uh, picture of... Uh, um annihilate hinduism stuff sarji mere laptop me keju ki atma gaya hai please forgive me if some comments are not relevant lol 
who was questioning Mughal sexuality, or do people still assume that Babri Masjid belongs to Babar instead of his? Uh, Babri Masjid is does not belong to any of them, right? It was built by some uh, one of one of one of his generals, who I think uh, built it as a tribute to Babar. I guess after Babar died. Uh, please bring Chandrachur Ghosh on your podcast. Yeah, the problem with uh, uh, bring Chandrachur Ghosh or uh, Anuzdhar is that I don't know what new thing I'm going to ask them. It's going to be the same questions. Tell me how, where was Gumnami Baba? Uh, if if some interesting questions or some even interesting line of questions comes to my mind while while reading the rest of Conundrum, then I'll probably uh, bring them. Well, let's see if there's any uh, update. Uh, of Abhas Ji, let's see where he is. Uh, no, no such Abhas anymore. Well, at uh, eight thirty, he did say that he's reaching in twenty-seven minutes. So I guess he's just ready and he'll join uh, any time now. Let's let's continue our discussion by then. Uh, the study circle is not the same uh, guys as Lefty Carter. Oh, I see. That's an Azim Prem Ji and I hear it Hinduism poster. Did you read? uh sagas of bharat's thread on dr ambedkar quite provocative no let me read to you that that scroll uh, article before uh before abhas ji joins uh, because we'll do a separate live stream on uh, on him uh, uh, on that topic anyway look we are saying how much have you read uh, on the history of rajputan are you aware of the lie of thousand year of islamic slavery and do you know about omendra ratnu and his books I've heard of Omendra Ratnu. I know that he writes history books. I don't uh, know anything more than that. And why is the thousand year slavery lie? Uh, because, I mean, there was Islamic invasion. Not everything about it was slavery because Rajputs uh, collaborated whenever uh, they felt the need. Sometimes they collaborated, sometimes they fought, sometimes again they collaborated again, or sometimes again they fought. It was all, all uh, mixed up, right? What about that human POS... Uh, uh, what what are, what are you talking about, AK? What's the update on podcast with Sri Sanjeev Sanyal? Yeah, we are doing a pre-recorded podcast with Sanjeev Sanyal on uh, Tuesday. It's not going to be live live streamed. Uh, I'll I'll upload it when I can. I guess on the same day or the next day. Please go out and vote tomorrow. Lokjan Badolat Khatche Gadame. What vote is? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's already what month? Yeah. Keju ki atma. The PhD candidate believes that for Hindutva to evolve, it needs to bring Ambedkar and Savarkar together. Hmm. As usual, a Bengali named Priyanka Paul Trans was involved in that in making that poster. Yeah, at least that that poster is pretty. <laughs> at least it's good art. At least the colors were nice. That's all I can say. But uh, so many for for so many weird random things, there are FIRs filed. But for completely now, this is not even the. Uh, there can't even be a, let's say, uh, a debate or, or subtlety or nuance in this, uh, in this conversation because they are not even talking about the the Brahminical aspect of Hindu uh, Hinduism. They are directly saying eradi- eradicate Hinduism or annihilate Hinduism. Even now, uh, I guess people should should take some steps, unless it could be argued that they are not calling for violence. I I wonder what was spoken of in the in the in the seminar. Let's see, where is that article by scroll? Okay, let me uh, read that. We'll do a separate live stream on that. I was supposed to do it yesterday. Got got stuck in a lot of work. Uh, let me see. I'll have to give a s- timestamp later on for when, when Abhasji does become available. Scroll, scroll. Yeah, here's the scroll article. So the headline says, How Decolonial Hindutva, quote-unquote Decolonial Hindutva, marries nativist politics with left-wing vocabulary how it does it okay in the headline at least there's no criticism pre-recorded cano uh i don't know exactly why i guess uh, uh so that I- if at all some something unwanted is said we can delete it later on uh, oh there he is i didn't have to read the uh, read the R scroll article anyway abhas ji is here Hello, Abbas. Hello. Hello. I'm really sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Can you hear me? Right. I can hear you. Am I okay. audible? Please? Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, so, are you ready? We, we are live already. Can we start? Yeah, yeah, we can. Surely do okay. it. Okay. So, Abbas, I'm most curious about your transition from being a leftist to a non-left historian. 
a historian not not directly maybe maybe lots of transitions in between but it's a it's a huge turn of events how did that happen so yeah it's uh, you know I, this journey certainly has been uh, when i look back then uh, it looks like that it has been a long transition hmm. but uh, still when i think begin to just think about it it just looks like that it was just a yesterday because so it's so is the nature of life because you know often on social media somebody you know that there's different kind of reactionaries somebody would say me that you know he had just become a new right wing and so <laughs> on and on so then i was just wondering that okay it was in 2013 when this transition happened okay and i'm 35 year old okay so it means that 2013 to almost 12 years so one more than one third of my life what i have lived so far in 35 years 12 years is just not very close by or something it's yeah. been a while ago yeah right so but uh, you know uh, uh, what happens with our hindu society largely is that uh, while this is the beauty of our uh, faith system or if you may like to call it a religion though religion certainly is a very western construct but mm-hmm. still for the sake of vocabulary so that mm-hmm. everyone can come on same page mm-hmm. so it is such a system where you are very vulnerable to uh, the external agencies it would happen that you will be made to feel or maybe that you yourself voluntarily will start to feel that there's something wrong in the tradition hmm. because it's very open system to a large extent it was certainly not that uh, enforcing in us as a system as how the uh, the majhabs of the religions like hmm. say islam is or say christianity is hmm. right it's very frozen uh, in, in its own ideas and for me it was always that uh, because my father was is a historian oh uh, yeah so i would hear a lot of things from him about uh, our past uh, mostly the academic part of it and uh, just when, though my family was very it still is very traditionalist in its own way that they will observe all the traditions very holistically nothing is to be missed it has to be followed the way it is no change per se as far as the rituals and everything is concerned but the moment i began to drift from it because if you are interested in science if you are interested in rationality at times it will happen that you will begin to question your thought pro- uh, your tradition hmm. and while in islam and christianity there would be push back Hmm. but it necessarily doesn't happen in a hindu household hmm. it happened with me too there was no hmm. push back if i am hmm. saying that oh, there is something i need not i don't want to sit in this puja i don't hmm. want to you know it all and as soon as i entered into the architecture school hmm. it so happened that uh, architecture school is a place where you are told to explore into more and more into freedom of expression because hmm. that's where you express your creativity yeah because you are from kolkata you mm. would be surrounded with a lot of people who are into the art yeah who are into, who are into you meet the people from jadavpur shipur yeah. right and uh, especially if you meet the people who are archi or the architecture mm. students so you would understand that what they are trying to do they are mm. always trying to break the barrier do something right which is just beyond and so it did happen with me too and i was uh, undergoing architecture education in katak the college called pilu modi college of architecture okay and uh, so uh, there was a subject called history of architecture hmm. and there was a subject called theory of design hmm. so when you are reading theory of design so it does happen that uh, you will come across modernism right you will come across post modernism yeah so now people in the current discourse because the new channels and etc they relate it with as a political movement but actually these were the art movements hmm so modernism was actually an art movement and post modernism again was a kind of a art movement hmm. when derrida was writing a lot about the philosophies which led to the deconstructivism and so on so he was trying to see art as a tool of the revolution hmm. so what you so uh, 
and deconstructivism which is another form of say postmodernism hmm. and that what we do is that you just try to go against the tradition right that is deconstructivism hmm. it means that if i break it in a simple way say that you have got a plot hmm. for yourself it's a rectangular plot a normal mind will tell you that you have to leave the setbacks from each and every side as per the local regulation right and then you will do a rectangular building but a deconstructivist will say that hey can i do a triangular building within a rectangle hmm. so even if it's not needed by the function he will end up doing it just for the sake of going against the wind of that period right because it sees a root in the cultural marxism hmm. because cultural marxism which was a gramsci said that uh, yeah, the, it says that you know the history is set or the tradition is set by the powerful people of that period hmm. so you have to break that yeah you have to go against them hmm. the moment you will change that the moment you will break this elite people who are the hmm. capitalists who are on the top in the hierarchy hmm. the history will begin to change because they have told you that history works this way hmm. that's why tradition is that way hmm. so and when i was reading these stuff then suddenly i got exposed to cultural marxism and uh, i got exposed then to uh, the works of karl marx the prophet of the religion called marxism per se and uh, i i i read the das capital and i was and so it happens you know uh, that if you have not read much about indian philosophies if you have not read much about the eastern philosophies and if you read the works of karl marx suddenly it will start making a lot of sense yeah you feel that though it's utter garbage if i have to say yeah. right but you still feel that oh, i have come across something very philosophical yeah someone is thinking about changing the world hmm. someone has an equation right yeah. and that equation is so bizarre that <laughs> which actually desires to have everybody to have equal amount of share in the system yeah irrespective of how much work you do hmm. right so, so i was delusioned into it and uh, so it happened but there came a phase when uh, i was working in a college as a uh, lecturer in design and i had gone in a study trip with a few students uh, to aurangabad uh, where the the great case of the elora and the ajanta mm. exists mm. and when i first we walked into the elora caves and when i went there it was so that uh, so far i had drawn the sketches of the kailasha temple hmm. for 10 odd marks in history of architecture hmm. right so just i have to get those 10 marks you draw the sketch you get 10 marks right but when i saw it for the first time live i was taken aback that oh my god what it is it's, of course it's the the kind of carving which has gone into making of it is terrific hmm. detailing is just marvelous scale had taken me off the i would ju- i just couldn't comprehend that what a large scale like that means hmm. and when it came in front of my eyes i still remember that phase that i could feel that my hairs are raising and some tears are rolling down my eyes and it's very different emotion hmm. so somehow the structure has got me emotional hmm. but that still was on the breaking point the breaking point came as we further progressed in the second half of the day towards the ajanta not second half, i think it was a, yeah it was the next day we went to the ajanta and when we went there we entered inside the caves and of course inside the caves you have got some very beautiful paintings hmm and that's what ajanta is known for yeah and i was quite curious to learn that you know cave is a dark place how the how did they really make so much of detailed paintings yeah so uh, i asked the person but could because I, i knew one thing for sure that the only source of light back then was fire hmm. or the natural light hmm sun but uh, certainly the natural light of the sun won't be there because it's not the uh, it can't reach there directly hmm. Right. and you simply can't have the the you can't be using the fire because mm. if you use the fire the colors which are being used are organic taken mm. out from the plants etc mm. so if you introduce the fire the carbon will come because organic right. material 
when they yeah. react they pull the carbon the painting yeah. solution yeah so i wanted my answer the guide couldn't give a concrete answer so i asked one mr professor deshpande who is a very renowned architect of that reason okay he showed me through the model that uh, he had a wooden model of the place and uh, the caves of the ajanta have a very uh, have anomaly anomaly is this that you enter into the cave and you step down so ek gaddi ki tarah hota there is a ditch inside right. large ditch so then he brought the model brought some water brought a torch and made the whole place uh, dark uh, put on the curtains and all it was a dark place and then he st- put the water inside that ditch in the model itself and then he brought a torch from and the torch light came and fell onto that water and something was in the surface it reflected back the so called snell's law of reflection the light comes oh. in certain place and the light was generated so he I said see. that this is the way those guys were making the paintings by generating the light and yes. i is like oh my god because this is 1500 years back the people yeah. who i thought to be the most backward because i had this uh, conviction now that the hindu monks or anybody who uh, subscribed to the indic ideas are some sort of stupid people they just <laughs> yeah. The, yeah what they are doing what they are chanting they are this mm. all are just utter nonsense yeah. but these people were using the so called snail's law of reflection to generate the light today everyone is in awe struck with that suranama yeah. the sutilak of shri ram in ayodhya but the similar concept was being used back then to generate so much of light inside mm. the cave mm. and that how they did the painting and i was like that ill because i knew that what had happened to galileo i knew mm. it right i knew that what was the history of science in the west yeah how the scientists were persecuted mm. i also knew about what happened to the uh, the people in al andalus and other places the islamic states back then uh, who tried to subscribe to the idea of the science i knew that mm. so but here the same people who would have set the rules mm. like dear the monks this is the the rishis and all mm. uh, right they mm. would be the rule setter yeah. they are the people of religion mm. and they are using science so <laughs> it was a eureka moment for me i see what civilization it is right, and i right. can read back and uh, read back as in the journey began by reading the works of uh, buddhism hmm. buddhism to upanishad and upanishad say i, I began to look a bit into uh, the uh, rigveda to start with and so when you start reading into religion hmm. you get introduced to history yeah by default because culture w- works with the religion and religion uh, and culture and religion works with history because history is nothing but the tale of the culture of a place right hmm. in a given period yeah so that's when i got introduced to the indic uh, world view hmm. and uh, of course i read about uh, the the great warriors and uh, but of course not the academic book it was hmm. all through say the primary sources uh, the I translated see. works and all i see so the detour had happened and hmm. uh, this detour was very important one and it pushed me into exploring into history and um, it was in say 2017 or 18 something like that when mm. i got a bit active on twitter yeah so uh, it was just i came on twitter to raise a com- complaint because uh, my house back in hazari bagh was uh, coming into uh, was to be demolished for the nhai construction okay and there was a large uh, chunk of land and the house everything mm. and i came to know that the somehow the government is paying very bad compensation acha so and everyone is taking and going ahead and because you are the, from the eastern belt you will know that how people react that mm. you know jo deti hai just le lo and chal do you know that how the mentality yeah. is at times mm. but i was quite alarmed and uh, someone said me you know aajkal sarkar sunti hai twitter pe mm. i thought that let's come on social media mm. let's open a uh, twitter account and i wrote a open letter and the next day uh, my mp jain sinha shoot me a, shot me a, a dm and over the dm he gave me the concerned numbers and somehow the compensation what we got was way better than other people it was mm. some due process a lot of things happened I but see. i got faith in the social media mm. and then 
whatever i read about uh, the history i started expressing it mm. i started to rebut people and mm. eventually people began to like it people like vivek agnihotri ratan sharda mm. prafulla ketkar there were so many people who just came by my back mohan das pai and they said that abhas you should write more and more right and uh, so had these people not been there perhaps i won't have taken such a huge thing of uh, trying to rebut just everybody it would be mm. that every week i have to rebut at least exactly. two people exactly yeah exactly. so that's where the journey began so your main trigger to being becoming a non left person was elora ajanta caves only yes certainly one thing always comes to my mind are these caves such such incredible such seemingly inhuman architecture possible anymore because one those being built as far as uh, let's say left leaning arguments go one those being because because people were being treated like slaves and with in the era of minimum wage laws and stuff those can't be built anymore yeah it's very tough to do it now because hmm. uh, there there are many reasons to it many times people get into the emotional way to express it that hmm. you know we don't have that dedication hmm. and of course i agree that dedication is certainly reduced uh, and dedication has just not reduced because of uh, the people don't want to do it but because of circumstances around that yeah. here what we do as an architecture is more to suffice the materialistic need right. of the period hmm. if say that i just decide that i am so much into the indic thought hmm. i want to do something for it and if i just say that you know can i just think to build some that piece of architecture perhaps i would fail to even make my living because mm. there will be no takers for that project to start with <laughs> yeah right and uh, again not for good or bad of somebody but uh, osho used to say one thing that even if you want to do something for the society you have to first make yourself your stomach filled enough you have to wealthy enough you have to and our system also has been that we support the concept of the earth mm. right earth yeah. kama dharma moksha that's how it goes yeah. we are not that you know suffering earning is not a ban for us we are the people who you know cherish everything enjoy everything or we believe in earning more and more money hmm. and somehow architecture as a profession exists in a way right now where it needs to elevate itself a lot because it hmm. went architecture is always subject of the what the society is ready to give to the architects exactly because architects will certainly react to what people of that period want what is the, whatever there is their requirement the more and more wealth will be in mass the more and more wealth will be created more and more better architecture will come we mm. may have the flexibility of timelines as well like today right now i'm working on a project of a commercial project which is many floors uh, maybe but i am being given to build it in less months than the number of floors which is going to be there that's my timeline yeah i just can't do something and that way so there are a lot of factors to it but certainly i have a conviction that because uh, you know there, there is always something in the blood when you go to aurangabad still hmm. there is a patni sari which is very famous from the land and there are okay. many other artworks which come from there okay. so people have carried that legacy they hmm. uh, like bengal itself carries the legacy irrespective of what may happen to the political construct and everything when it comes to the art when it comes to sangeet right mm. bengal always had it like now mm. people you will find that there's so many bands which come from yeah. kolkata itself yeah. right there will be so many local bunch of people who will be singing somewhere yeah. so it is always ingrained in the blood mm. so i have this thing that india certainly has it but perhaps the time has still not come people mm. can get emotional and say that हमको ये करना चाहिए वो करना चाहिए बट इट्स प्रैक्टिकली नॉट डूएबल राइट नाउ राइट सर व्हाट व्हाट वाज लाइफ लाइक ओह फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल लेट मी आस्क यू आर यू स्टिल एन आर्किटेक्ट या या आई स्टिल लाइक मेकिंग बिल्डिंग इज माय सोर्स ऑफ लिविंग हाउ हाउ डू यू मैनेज दैट पर्सनल टाइम वाइज हाउ आर यू रिसर्चिंग फॉर बाबर एंड आल्सो डिजाइनिंग हाउसेस या यू नो इट्स वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग बट व्हाट हैपेंस दैट so architecture as a profession looks very glamorous profession because uh, maybe that they will just maybe the people have not watched fountainhead or they have not read fountainhead so that's why their perception about architecture more comes from that shahid kapoor's film where he was an architect i don't remember uh, yeah so hmm. uh, they don't even so most of the time architecture as a profession is considered that there would be somebody you would be sitting in a corner cabin just some thoughts would be flowing you know, you will do some 
you know glamorous sketches and yeah. suddenly oh wow and all those kind of emotions will yeah. come right but architecture is a very taxing profession because mm. it's a part of a real state mm. and like someone said some time back that uh, though uh, among the white collar professions professional some sometimes a uh, medical professional can bury his mistake mm. right it was said in a humor that you know person dies and we said that something went wrong or something but architects mistake will come up hmm. it will yeah. always be seen by the people it will never right. be dead yeah so we don't have, but it loads a lot of frustration as well at times hmm. so uh, at times you will be uh, wondering that how you are going to solve that ac ventilation problem and all hmm. you know you are designing an office building you're not getting 10 foot height after the fall ceiling because the hvac duct is passing and all and that will be all in your mind because tomorrow morning you have to present the solution to the client and there's so many stakeholders with crores and crores of rupees taken from so it's yeah. a very different kind of pressure yeah. right so how do you shade off that pressure hmm. uh, or the frustration rather hmm. so for me it has always been looking into the history hmm. because it too it's very connected to architecture too because to access the history of the past i am looking into the architecture hmm. is the instances of the forts is the instances which uh, like when i went to kashi okay <laughs> sir no uh, i apologize uh, so we were discussing uh, yeah about architecture and how yeah. i yeah. so yeah it's more like a you know, history is more like a medicine to really get rid of all the frustration which comes through your site and mm. uh, the real estate yeah so it makes me live through and yeah. it does happens that after i'm back from work i will again work on history i will read uh, i will make the notes i will work on my further books and also at times i am working simultaneously on three four books too it does happen so yeah. because I, and i get that advantage because i'm not trained historian right so uh, at times people will make this uh, they will try to show look down upon you and say that you know you're not a trained historian i often get the comments and uh, and of course at least like vikram sampath is a trained historian because he's a phd of, mm. of course he didn't had a bachelor's or masters in that but mm. the phd in history yeah. but still people do drag him and i have nothing right yeah. <laughs> so uh, but uh, that somehow adds to my own advantage because i am not doing a living for history i am mm. not supposed to if i have taken this task i am not destined to finish this off in a certain period because mm. uh, i will not be paid stipend based on mm. what i do on that my right. something else is my bread and butter and i do so it in a way works to my favor mm. and uh, uh if at all i get uh, irritated working on certain part of a history i may jump to something else mm. um it would happen that uh, i don't not like babar certainly is a book around the medieval history mm. but at times i will jump back to the ancient mm. i am writing something around that mm. i'll start researching about the buddhism so anything of the past really excites me and that happens to be a good source to rid of the frustration mm. sir i want most of my viewers especially my my biggest crowd is 18 to 25 I I I want them to get into writing and especially academia if possible no matter what their current profession is. So uh f- for that I'm asking you uh, could you give us uh, tips and pointers that h- do you do b- both every day or is it like phases some days you are into just architecture and then some days just writing how do you manage both because both are pretty so, taxing. Yeah it is and but uh I don't keep it very religious that way. Hmm. like architecture is has to be religious because it's my profession hmm. i am bound by a contract and i have to hmm. perform where right. i am working but uh, here it is not a very religious thing that i have to but uh, it so happens that what gives you charm hmm. what happens to be something of like i know people who if they don't hit the gym after they work hmm. they won't be very happy hmm. so it becomes uh, even if it's not very regimental they don't want to impose upon themselves it's a very intuitive it becomes mm. a voluntary task which they always do mm. so for me it has happened that every day if i don't read say 
half an hour 45 minutes or maybe at least an hour anything i'm maybe reading it i read a lot of fiction okay so what fiction does is that it gives you a lot of food for thought as in how the philosophies work hmm. as in philosophy uh, when i say philosophy necessarily i am not trying to say that how the philosophical model was in the hmm. greece or in india yeah. but i'm talking about the philosophy that how different kind of people think because the work of the fiction writers right uh like say for example ken follett then you recently the work knife of salman rushdie it's come up mm. so i got the book last evening and i have almost 90% through it already so, uh, yeah so it's a small book not a big one but what fiction does is that it uh, of course gives you it takes you to another uh, world altogether because fiction is a thing which is not something running parallelly to you Hmm. neither it is something which happened in the past you know that it ne- never happened hmm. but it's a imaginative story it gives you a lot of philosophies it gives you a lot more exciting angles to look into the life and uh, it teaches you how to write hmm. because the biggest struggle for the academic writers hmm. and the people who want to write in non fiction hmm. is to really come to a point where their writing can become more exciting yeah it can be as exciting as a fiction so nothing against the people who don't want to go to the fiction mode or want to but i i have this way of thinking that our writing must be very engaging it should feel mm-hmm. like a story even if i'm telling a tale which actually happened 500 years mm-hmm. it need not go like a monotonous academic books like mm-hmm. how it used to be like if you pick the works of Ro- and i will give take two examples if you pick william dalrymple William Dalrymple is amazing how he writes the non-fiction. Okay. He's amazing. Hmm. Uh, the way he weaves the story. That's the non- that's exactly what the narrative non-fiction is. Hmm. Again, Vikram Sampath, amazing hmm. non-fiction writer. Hmm. When you pick the book of Romila Thapar or Irfan Habib, you will just get bored. It hmm. there's a lot of information. Uh, again, uh, right now I'm picking it from a point of view not that who is right or left, I'm just picking the name so that people hmm. can understand the way the writing works. so their work is very will not keep be able to keep you so engaged into something hmm. right so th- their writing is not very much in the flow as it's of vikram sampath or is right. of william dalrymple is right? that distinction uh, because of uh, pop history versus academic history or is it or would you categorize that as uh, just bad writing or or uh, interesting writing versus uninteresting writing so you know you use the word bad writing and one of my friend uh, abhinav agrawal who also lives in bangalore okay uh, yeah so he he is an amazing writer and he recently did his book on mahabharata so oh. so he he says this very clearly that you know we really have bad writers and the good writers hmm so i would certainly categorize william dalrymple and uh, uh, vikram sampath as great writers hmm. very good writers hmm. but as far as the work of romeo sapper goes they are very bad writers they hmm. maybe Uh, very crisp in terms of the, uh, uh, putting across the information hmm. the book will get bulky hmm. but the writing is really terrible it just can't keep you engrossed right hmm. and if we are dealing with subject where we want the people to get more and more interested hmm. we have purpose see even the, this marxists had the purpose they wanted to really get into the psyche of the people they wanted to tell the history from a atrocity literature perspective hmm. But, but still their purpose got suffice despite not writing very interestingly because that became a mode of earning too like <laughs> people saw that the people who are pursuing a career in say humanities hmm. if they don't subscribe to those books or those information yeah. they certainly they will not be able to build a career yeah and anything which comes to your uh, living hmm. becomes such a precious thing to you that you stick to it yeah had they been writing in the era of now hmm. maybe that uh, you know the results what they will bring will not be the same as how hmm. it happened in the past hmm. so imagine that william dalrymple chooses the way to write as how R- R- professor romila thapar wrote hmm. then maybe that hit books will not do that great yeah. right and uh, and certainly as far as the uh, the the, the, uh, the political point of view are concerned Hmm. I mean I certainly won't agree to William Dalrymple hmm. to that great extent yeah right but uh, as far as writing is concerned it's 
really is very good. So there's something from where people can learn that how to write the proper nonfiction. Hmm. And in fact, the people who get into the academic writing, say the journals, paper writing, they need to make it even more interesting. I understand hmm. that uh, the journals, etc., has its own protocols, hmm. the way you put the things in. All, but still, the narrative can be made to uh, make hmm. interesting one. Right. Right. You can pass through a journal only by putting citations, the footnotes, the way yeah. you know it, it will go through there. Hmm. But it doesn't mean that it will become something which thousands and thousands of people will read or maybe mm. that it will not become that brick in the wall which will change the whole <laughs> book, right? right how would you rate your book uh, on barber or do you think it, it can pass the muster i i haven't read it personally okay so asking you uh what what do you think of it uh as, as the author that uh, honestly uh do you think it passes muster or will it be categorized as just pop history can it be, can it be taught in college or university classrooms? That's what I'm asking. So uh, I would be very honest with you, not because mm. it's my book, but mm. I would rate it as a document or a text. Okay. Which certainly will be a go-to material who wants to start to learn about the history of Babur and his successors. I see. Okay. And though I wrote it from a narrative non-fiction format, as in it's more like a story, mm-hmm. but the information, what whatever has been fed there, everything is thoroughly checked everything is based on the primary source and in fact i went to two steps further following the footsteps of sir jadunath sarkar hmm. so sir jadunath sarkar had said in 1953 to his pupils and to their pupils while he was retiring okay he said that this is a golden period of indian historiography because now we can get access to every document of the period in which it happened the incidents mm. happened so we can go back to the authorities directly and in the languages of the authorities mm. say that you want to talk about the ancient india so he meant that you know we have documents available in similar language you want to talk about the uh, early medieval then you have got the documents in the persian farsi yeah. right he said it but the mantle was carried forward by a lot of people like mm. rc mazumdar yeah. right and uh, there are many more who did it but there came a period from 1970s onwards where <laughs> the debacle picked up. Yeah, and that's when the people like Dr. Colin Elst and uh, S. R. Goel or hmm. uh, say K. S. Lal and many people came into the picture. Hmm. Uh, so, but there, what happened that these scholars got stuck into the cultural wars because hmm. that time it so happened that. You know, if you don't engage into this cultural war, mm. then perhaps the whole idea of the Shatru both will die up or yeah. the idea to actually understand that what enemy means or what, who we are, the swim both, right? Mm. So their literature was largely concentrated on that point of view. Mm. And it was only because we had got certain historiography, which was really disparaging us, which were yeah. really trying to show us in the worst of the light. So those works were also equally important. Hmm. But in this, what happened that the kind of literature what R.C. Mazumdar produced, right? Or say that Sir Jadunath Sarkar produced hmm. the fall of the Mughal Empire. Hmm. Right? We never had any such literature coming up to, we didn't had a lot of detailed work, hmm. right? So when I look at my book of Babar, it's around 500 pages, 480 odd pages, but it's just hmm. part one. Part two of Babar is also going to come. Oh. Yeah. So, and I learned Farsi because I had to follow the footsteps of Jazuna Sarkar. Hmm. And I was seeing that there is discrepancies among the translations. Hmm. So, you can, if there are discrepancies, so it means that perhaps there was either the person who translated didn't understand it properly, hmm. or the other person didn't understand it properly, or both of them were serving to certain agendas of the masters they reported to. Hmm. Whatever. We don't yeah. know the reason, but there were discrepancy. So yeah. the best way to erase that discrepancy to a large extent was to read the manuscript at your own. Hmm. So Babar, uh, Babar's uh, primary source will be Babar Nama, which is also called Tujike Babari. Okay. And Babar had written in a language called Chaktai Turki. Hmm. It was the, the, the language which existed back then. Okay. Uh, the language of the Timurids. And uh, so... But uh, the later that, that manuscript was translated into Farsi or the Persian. Hmm. 
and it was done at the orders of Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar okay in 1589 hmm. so say that around uh, say 55 decades after Babur died hmm. his Babur now was translated into Persian now okay. we don't have the Turkey, uh, Turkey, uh, Turkey manuscript. What Babur had written, it had disappeared. We don't have any oh. document, okay. but we have this Persian or the Farsi manuscript, which mm. was which appeared around five decades after. And because mm. we have to assume that because Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar got it translated, mm. so it, there won't be much flaw. Mm-hmm. So I learned Farsi. I accessed the original manuscript, which we have in our Indian archive. Mm. Right, one can go in the National Museum and access it. Right. Mm. So I read that I made the notes out of it by mm. translating that mm. what what this says uh, what the story and then I began to write it mm. and then accordingly I supported my book with which folio I have referred to so okay. it's all mentioned that this part I'm talking so this part is coming from this folio mm. so a disclaimer has already been made that book is entirely based on the translation of the original Babur Nama okay. Wherever I was lacking some tra- in translation, I got back to the already translated work. Hmm. I refer to that. I have given a note where I have used the translation. Achha, the footnote will tell. So I made this distinction. Hmm. So largely this happens to be a book which can, uh, of course, I won't say blindly because uh, when you say blindly, then it it's becomes a negative connotation. People can do their due diligence. But this certainly is a book to go for to know about hmm. how the empire got into existence. Hmm. Why why Babur? Were you were you a fan of him? <laughs> were you pissed off with him? What made you write about Babur specifically? So, you know, uh, yesterday we got done with Ram Naomi. Yeah. Uh, yesterday was a Ram Naomi. And I come from a place called Hazaribagh, hmm. which was eight hours drive from Kolkata. Yeah. So, and Hazaribagh is known to be very volatile, Hmm. Uh, for religious sentiments, etc. Hmm. And Ram Naomi is very famous that hmm. when Ram Naomi will happen, something wrong is going to happen. And nice. I was, while I was just returning back, uh, while I was chatting with you that, you hmm. know, I'm going to be late and all. Yeah. So I was stuck in the Bangalore traffic and I, I, I was talking to my father and he just said that in some reason, something had happened. Okay. So uh, it has always been that, uh, you know, when it Ram Nami comes, something would be there. Hmm. And nowadays, people are hearing about the large Hanuman flag and all, like yeah, Hanuman, yeah. etc. Hmm. But in Hazari Bagh, there would be big processions hmm. uh, where people would come with 40 feet, 50 feet, 60 feet Hanuman Dhwaj. Hmm. And a big processions will go through. Right. right. And uh, so, uh, so basically, Ram is of great importance in Hazaribagh. Right. Now, when Babri incidents had happened, I was mm. four year old in 1992, four year old and some months. Mm. And when we were not the captives of the narrative through the smartphones, it was the words of the cha-cha, chachi, uncle, aunt, yeah. and da, dadi, and what people mm. around you are talking. Mm. And especially when you are four, five, six, seven, eight, these are your formative years. Mm. And from three, four years, you start having those things stored in a memory, yeah, which yeah. is always ingrained. Yeah. So when this incidents happened and Hazari Bagh being Hazari Bagh, there was mm. always a discussion around it. Mm. Right. Someone would be talking that. So by Babri, I always understood that it's about Babur. So this mm. was the story told to me that well, there was a king called Babur. And mm. because my father was a historian, mm. uh, he's a historian. So he said that uh, he told me the story about the Mughal Empire. And then back then, a big uh, serial used to come on DD National. It was on Akbar, Akbar the Great or something. Well, I don't okay. remember exactly what okay. the uh, title of that serial was. Hmm. It will show uh, Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar in big, great light. Hmm. And even the title song of that would be very interesting, uh, trying to secularize Akbar as much as possible. Yeah. So, uh, so... Now, Babar is there in some form. Then mm. I, I've seen the serial of Akbar. Yeah. My father has told me the story of the Mughal Empire. Mm. And then in the schools, of course, in the NCRT books, yeah. uh, it was told that Akbar was the first king who tied India as a one nation. Mm. Right? Mm. So all these things kept you very excited about that, of course. And 
like if i if you talk to anybody that you can meet do this survey and ask mm-hmm. anyone from say the age group of 15 to 20 and just ask that you know can you please name 10 indian kings then with the first name will come akbar yeah second ashok might appear yeah right yeah so but you will rarely hear about any king's name from pala dynasty yeah you will hardly uh, hear even in bengal you will yeah. not tell uh, sena sena dynasty you will never hear about it. they yeah. might not be aware about you will ask them do you know that there was some great man called shashank hmm. they will say they will try to find out that was he somewhere around 1950 or something so yeah. the brain will not yeah. process it even yeah but akbar will certainly be in their side yeah. right and then the somewhere down and because the films were also made in a way we had yeah, mughal azam hmm we had jodha akbar hmm. so it gets ingrained but as i grew and i had already stepped out of the architecture school hmm. and uh, i was no more that secular person as hmm. i was hmm. so uh, and then 5 years back or 5 and a half years back hmm. india today had circulated a meme and it was after tejasvi surya made some comment on india today conclave okay about he criticized akbar he criticized the mughal empire and that took the nerves of people and that's when india today circulated a meme hmm. and that meme was about uh, uh, was showing that india had a gdp share of around 25% hmm. when the mughals ruled hmm. so i got curious because now i had started reading history and i had certainly had very strong opinion about these things mm. uh, i had read about the atrocity mm. so um, of foreign jeep till then to a mm. great extent so i thought that it may be a good point to really explore into this economic angle mm. and i saw the source it was angus madison mm. they had given the credit that angus madison is the source of this information mm. so i um, went uh, got the book Hmm. the book of angus madison is called uh, the world economic history contours of world economic history from 1ad to 2030ad hmm. so in that angus madison the economist uh, tells uh, gives a projection that what would happen in the future till 2030 to the economies and it gives a analysis of what was in the past okay while in this mughal era that is around 15 or 1600 he says that uh, the gdp share the world gdp share of india was around 25% hmm this is the statistics then the same statistics the same book says in 1000 c it was 32% hmm the same uh, book and the same table which was used by india today says that in 1 c or 1 ad it was 32% hmm our gdp share in fact got below china for the first time in the reign of akbar the great i see So uh, then that kept me going curious that okay the so you know that's called selective quoting that right somehow it's like hitting the nail on your own leg that hmm. you are continuously doing it because the source is actually saying something else against it's going against your narrative it's fa- going to favor the Indian Surya more yeah. right and then I looked at another interesting data which was about GDP per capita growth hmm. right so now fifteen rate sixteen rate seventeen rate all throughout gdp share of india is 24 25 somewhat constant hmm. right so it has fallen from what hmm. it was in the past yeah. but it's almost constant yeah now gdp per capita growth was negative from 1500 to 1820 that's when the mughals ruled no i see so i was like that if you uh, an empire has been able to maintain the wealth hmm. right that means the gdp uh, what is gdp uh, gdp is the total sum of all the uh amount of money and everything whatever is there right yeah. and uh, so if that has been constant in the world's proportion hmm. and if the gdp per capita growth is going negative it means that people are becoming poorer so hmm. you have got two interesting curves that people who are the administrator or who are ruling you their curve or the government's curve is going like this or has been flat hmm. while the people's curve has been going like this hmm. it means that they were extorting money yeah they were having they were uh, holding the money and they were not using it on the people right they were forced production hmm. so then i referred to a book by irfan habib and tapan roy choudhury called cambridge economic history of india okay that exposed the mughal empire very well I that see. what was a economic condition it was very terrible 
Mm. And then I read more about it. I began to make the PowerPoint presentations. And that's when Mohandas Pai comes into the picture and he says that I was, uh, and actually PowerPoint presentation was the idea of Mohandas Pai. That okay. I first began to give normal lectures. Mm. Then he said that, you know, you should make a PowerPoint presentation. I made this. Then he said that, okay, PowerPoint to ho gaya. Now, if mm. you already have PowerPoint, why not go to the book? Mm. And that's where the journey began. And uh, so it was always that uh, I thought that maybe I will write a whole series on this empire, which is enigmatic because uh, because people don't, exactly don't know much about it. Yeah. So either he will tell good or bad about it. Either someone would be like, you know, Bauer was just a jihadi, the terrorist. I, do, I entirely agree he was a jihadi because that was his purpose. Hmm. But uh, uh, again, there were a certain bunch of people who will say that Bauer came and became one of us which actually didn't happen. Mm. So, but no one will be aware about it. If you ask those people that, can you please support uh, your claim with 10 arguments that why he was exactly the jihadi the way he was, mm. right? Maybe the side, this side will also not be able to produce 10 very good arguments. Yeah. Or maybe the five arguments which will come, which will be very off from being the factual. Okay. Sallow it, or I will sallow it only because say that, you know, it fits the bill. I, I know that this man is bad, hmm. but if you already someone is saying more bad about a person who is bad, so who cares, yeah. right? I right. can either ignore it. Yeah. Now, the point would be that some the person who is saying that he became one of us, hmm. and you ask that, can you give some argument? Hmm. And you will find that almost 10 of the arguments what the person will give, all will be factually wrong. Hmm. Or it will be... So, neither of the people were very aware about what are their facts. Hmm. I thought that why not do the objective biographies of these people hmm. bring all good and bad because when I say that uh, say that I do my own autobiography hmm. if I will be honest I will put good and bad all about me it is autobiography and hmm. I need to choose a real picture that will be the honesty as an author hmm. and so while I'm dealing with the biography of a man like Baba it was it became at most urgent that I bring all the shades of him or all the colors hmm. of him if he has done something disastrous, it will come out. Hmm. Right. So like I, I, I say at times that for when you talk about the glories of India, you do not over magnify it. Hmm. You do not go to an extent that everything great was always in India because hmm. India is al already so good. Yeah. It's, it's so glorious that you did not yeah. exaggerate it. Yeah. Because you exaggerate it when you get into this unscientific way of putting across the thing, hmm. then what it does, it, it makes you lose the battle. Hmm. because you're already placed so well right that yeah. you're winning a cricket match and then you suddenly do some kind of a thing then hmm. you know the batsman who was about to win the match yeah. for you and he just needs to go out because he has done some indisciplinary yes. acts yes. like soccer will be the best example that we yeah. Have, yeah. right so we did not do it we are exactly. just all very well placed yes. so it happens in this case too so hmm. let's do, uh, get very objective hmm. put it across as history it will come Babur certainly was not a good guy for Hindustan, hmm. not at all. I see. How great is Akbar, considering you are probably reading up on all of them now? Was he great? Not at all. And, I you see. know, because, and this itself is such a problem because Akbar itself means great. Oh, yeah, yeah. Allahu Akbar, hence. Yeah. The, so it becomes so interesting to say that you're saying the great, the great. Right. So it's so, yes, we can say Ashoka the Great, though I may disagree to a lot of points. To mm. Maybe that Chandragupta was a greater king. That's the reason why even the Gupta king tried to take the name of Chandragupta, that character. Mm. Not the Ashoka didn't appear much. But that's yeah. a different thing. Today, mm. let's not get into it. But yeah. uh, the Great the Great is itself such a <laughs> funny connotation, right? Yeah. So, and a lot of people would tell you that this guy was given the title Akbar from uh, a Rajput king. Like I said to you that I you see. Know, people who want to make a claim for them, they also don't know much about it. Hmm. People who want to claim against them, many don't know about them. Hmm. So, this title was given to Jalaluddin Muhammad by Jalaluddin Muhammad <laughs> while he okay. was getting coronated. I see. And you get to know about it from uh, Abul Fazal's uh, okay. Akbar Nama. Okay. 
so he explains that when coronation is happening and then jalal bin muhammad gives him this title akbar hmm. so what see i understand that you can give yourself title and everything but when the then when you begin to look at the character of this man you will find that the narcissism just drips i see he's I see. he's a very narcissistic person i see he is too much self centered in okay. terms of what he is he mm. his focus is entirely on himself mm. and that's the reason why there was a period when he was trying to flirt with the sharifs of makka and trying to become the khalifa i see so he had this aspiration that i want to become the khalifa and that's the reason why a lot of money was drained out of india and sent mm. to makka acha acha so again people would tell you that all the money which was of uh, the the hindustan it remained there they didn't take it anything but they were spending it just like anything for mm. non indic places for the muslim world hmm so uh like in 1576 jalaluddin mohammed akbar sent 6 lakhs uh, uh to makka 1 lakh separately was sent to the sharif of makka because okay. he was trying to bribe him oh. to become the khalifa because the ottomans were the khalifa back then acha and uh, yeah, so yeah. and he made the point that all the people who want to go for the hajj hmm. their whole hajj will be as sponsored by the government okay. right so akbar would sponsor it so and by the islamic doctrine a hajj is not supposed to be sponsored oh right? yeah yeah so forget what the so, so called secular state of india does hmm. for a while hmm. or what it did in the past or whatever hmm. now this is a rule of a islamic king hmm. still he is trying to become a khalifa by doing an un islamic act yeah now the question then arises that is there a thing called islamic and un islamic hmm. then again if we go back to the theological base that if you are able to suffice the larger good of islam hmm. then all other kufs can be okay it, 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 they will not supersede in fact the I superseding see. thing will be what you have done good for islam in larger I good i see so he did this but the ottomans being the ottomans they kicked akbar hard and hmm. finally his whole flooding with the sharifs of makkah had to stop acha and uh, then his old dream of being a khalifa stopped and got halted acha because he is unable to send out the money and all oh and uh, just imagine that just to give a perspective to your audience and hmm. the listeners that while akbar is sending 7 lakhs of rupees that is a period when average salary of a person is rupees 5 or 6 hmm so 5 or 6 per annum is his salary and yeah. here a person is sending 6 to 7 lakh of rupees to makkah right yeah. so it gives you a perspective that yeah. a lot of wealth was being spent yeah. on the on the muslims and the story goes in a way that the muslim world would specifically come and flock around makkah in that period when they came that hindustan se paise aa rahe oh so they flocked around there just to gain more and more money can i get some arms can i something come to me hmm. right so everyone waited for this caravan of the the mughals or the timurids rather uh, so that the, the money will come and they will catch hold of it i see what's so, his uh, what's akbar's uh, secularism uh, actions they were not much so what he did so i was explaining that only to you that uh, hmm. what happens next that he says that his project to become khalifa fails hmm. and i told you he was a narcissistic person yeah and he was a opportunist hmm. so now he thinks that you know because my uh, the mullahs or the maulvis are also going against me okay uh, because he's doing something where which is not falling in the line of islam so he thinks that can i found my own religion and that's where the dinai lahi comes into the picture hmm not because he was secular or he saw something he heard some story or there are many stories that he mm. saw something in the forest and all so there are stories mm. behind it that how he suddenly become secular mm. but uh, no he wanted to be the founder of a religion mm. he wanted to rule the people 
but so be it that not many people joined the nail life hmm. right so it just his again this project also failed the nail life was a failed project hmm. and uh, and in fact it was this period that when he is uh, trying to conceptualize the idea of the nail life and all during the battle of haldi ghati so the people are getting ready to go in the battle of haldi ghati against maharana pratap and that's when the badoni his uh, the court historian and the molvi comes and says that jahapana i i also want to go into the battle and i have this extreme desire of coloring my beard with the kafir's blood or the infidel's blood hmm. right and the jahapana akbar is so happy in the time when he's forming the nail i right the conceptualization of dinay lahi has begun almost hmm. and um, so uh, and he says that he gives 50 gold coins to badoni so imagine this so called your secular akbar hmm. is uh, giving 50 gold coins to somebody uh, just because he says that it shows a desire that he wants to color his beard by the blood of the infidels hmm his secularism was so 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 ugly that uh, when he went to invade in in himachal and there's a kalika mata mandir hmm. there around 200 cows had come to take the shelter because of the rain hmm. the hins uh, at his instruction the his soldiers went and killed all those 200 cows filled the blood of those cows in their boots sprinkled it onto the kalika mata and inside the temple right i see so he had some so it's the list is so enormous when he went to see chitor when when chitor yeah. fell the jahar is one of the worst what we know hmm. right and it happened during the holi hmm. and it said that on holi by the blood of the the people of chitor that it got colored because on the holika dahan there's a day we burn hmm. the holika hmm. and that's where the the royals and the other people other the ladies hmm. came and went to the jauhar hmm. and because uh, the rajput soldiers have been killed around hmm. we were 8000 in numbers and the next day uh, the shakha happens jauhar happens in the shakha so in the jauhar in one hand they have got the kangan and they all walk into all age group everybody just stepping into the fire right mass and mass and here the rajput warriors come wearing the saffron wearing the saffron turbans everything is saffron and they are not the warriors they are the normal people abul fazl calls them peasants in the narrative okay. they come into the battle against way way larger force of the timurid uh, timurids and they all get butchered slaughtered trying to save the temple and whatever they all fought and all got killed okay so and uh, akbar takes the title of the ghazi as well mm. and uh, so whatever he got from the temple of that place he took it and he uh, put it at the feet of um, uh, salim chisti mm-hmm. and recently a series had come called uh, taj on g5 or somewhere mm-hmm. where it says that uh, akbar gave the name salim to uh, jahangir because he was born by the blessing of salim chisti mm-hmm. uh, but uh, uh, salim chisti was very annoyed to see that what jaluddin mohammed akbar had done but the reality is that the S- sarin chisti was very happy to get the 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 looted wealth brought to him the gold and silver especially a candle stand which was uh, covered with the gold and it was very expensive thing it really made him so happy looking at what akbar brought he gave the blessing and that's where jahangir gets born and the name comes salim it was not the other way around okay so the story of the atrocities of this man is so so ugly we we in fact he was not he had a rule that if a woman walks into the public uh, without wearing the veil she will be put she will be made a prostitute okay so if a wife lies to the husband then also she is going to get the same treatment so some bizarre rules also this man had so mm. Uh, it's because very tough for me to comprehend that why he should be great in the land mm. bharat when we had in our examples the greatness is something very different mm. our yeah. examples greatness lies that and the greats like chandragupta maurya mm. right 
our our greatness lies in what the people like maharana pratap did or hmm. what chhatrapati shivaji maharaj did hmm. or what sachit burfakan did we have our definition of greatness in a very different way east yeah. west north south where hmm. we, we whether it's lalita ditya or anybody yeah. so so but this certainly cannot be the example of greatness and of course this is a title what he had given to him yeah and we carried it forward yeah is there any way to teach these things in schools without making basically all young muslims feel sad of their past or their ancestors what about darashiko was were there controversies surrounding him as well or, or if if he was so great as we we now learn why wasn't he ever brought to the forefront why did we need people like akbar and babar to be taught as great people so you know the foray is such mm-hmm. that when in fact kalam uh, uh, when we and our dr kalam's funeral happened hmm. we saw the number of people who walked in there yeah right and recently we saw the funeral of mukhtar ansari yeah how many <laughs> were there and yeah care mukhtar ansari even when you go back a bit what had happened to the maimon yeah right in his funeral yeah. what had happened in the burhan one is funeral yeah numbers were so so big hmm we had uh, in the, our times itself we saw dr kalam hmm. right but we didn't saw that reception yeah now the point is that why should a person from a particular religion only be the hero of that person of that religion hmm any one else can be the hero of that man too hmm right so a person say that who is a student of quantum physics hmm. right again this is a very different controversy that how west took up the science from us mm-hmm. today i don't want to you know get into that debate but still say that someone in studying physics in princeton or anywhere else he's going to see albert einstein is a hero hmm. he doesn't come from his religion but hmm. maybe that if one sees a science is a religion though yeah. of course it can't qualify it i'm just for the sake of argument yeah. so for someone who is a student of science maybe that he is studying somewhere in austria hmm. but jagdish chandra can, can be an example for him right so it is not dependent on that but somehow the construct of our historiography was based on cultural marxism hmm cultural marxism was about the rule of the intersectionality hmm it does that they have sets and subsets hmm while as far as the sets of the oppressed and the oppressor are concerned they have already defined it yeah so the muslim happened to be the oppressed people they mm. are within that set hindu happened to be the oppressor they have been placed in there yeah so even if in kashmir the population of the hindus will be drastically low mm. still the oppressor will be the hindu yeah so the justifications came for the kashmiri pandits by what happened to the kashmiri pandits by a lot of people yeah but they deserved it yeah landowners yeah <laughs> what happened yeah yeah actually yeah and the Mo- mopla the mopla yeah. massacre again so, landowners landowners <laughs> no akali so, also landowners yeah you see you see the same pattern and yeah. they somehow so the oppressor now when we look at the historiography of these history of these people the timurid empire or the moguls so they are seen to be as a representative of muslims hmm. they have been declared that they are the people who hmm. and so and that's how the the elite of the uh, around the period of the independence movement also saw it as hmm. or a bit uh, uh, before the independence movement like yeah. Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, yeah. founder of Aligarh Muslim University, he yeah. did it, right? So the people were trying to recognize it. That's the reason why even Tagore had to say hmm. what he said for uh, the uh, looking at the condition of political Islam. He said it hmm. that he saw the problems in the political Islam and yeah. he criticized Islam. Yeah. And uh, so did Savarkar. Hmm. So did. Uh, uh, in fact there were some writings of bhagat singh as well which i found that it was during the college days where he talks about the disdain among the muslims for uh, non urdu language hmm. so 
the people were recognizing it all the mm. leaders of that period they like and everybody yeah and but after the fall of the aurangzeb mm. when the empire was gone mm. so shahi walullah wrote uh, wrote to afghanistan saying that now because of the shah of, uh, uh, he writes that with the, with the fall of the aurangzeb suddenly the marathas and rajputs have become very powerful mm. the mughals we are the royal one we are supposed to rule and we are so the the recognition said what it was said that it would happen that if a malvi or the mullah is saying that you know the, we are the rulers and we are connected by them mm. right so whoever is going to follow that mullah malvi will follow that footsteps mm. so when certain jamaat e ulama hind uh, said that we will not support muslim league for the partition mm. then came a very interesting book book by the grandfather of current madani mm. deoband's madani whose grandfather wrote a book yeah and that book was called uh, islam and the composite nationalism yeah for which he got basically the bharat ratna later on yeah so reading that book by the title of book one would feel that oh wow it's about the national integration yeah but once you read that book that book is a proper separatist material what it says that it gives you a toolkit that why you are not supposed to go out of india because if you will go what would happen to your mosque mm. you will lose the purpose of gazwai hind mm. you will lose the purpose of islamizing the whole of the bharat mm. that yeah. book and the manual came and that book is now very easily available english translations is are there yeah. so people can go and read it it's a very short book so did not nehru uh, read this book before giving him bharat ratna i'm sure he didn't <laughs> now uh, why aren't people like uh, if if at all there are people if is there a plural of people like uh, darashiko why isn't he taught because he was not really a significant yeah. king or just because uh, he he did not fit the bill of what the muslim education ministers wanted indians to learn about that that fear them only only Legit. good muslim king is one who kills hindus <laughs> yeah you know you have hit the nail at the right point and that's okay. what ultimately see it's all about the perspectives hmm. so if uh, they can be the Muslims laying their life in the army, and uh, we saw there was yeah. a, uh, there was a there was a Orange hmm. who lost uh, has lost his life while fighting the terrorists, hmm. and there are many such people. So it is all the matter of the perspective. Hmm. The what perspective you have within the army? Hmm. Again, I am not going back to the pre-independence period where Dr. Ambedkar is criticizing that why so many yeah. Muslims are there, and so hmm. that is a different phase. Let's look at the current phase and the scenario. Yeah. the muslims who were serving the indian army a very different bunch of people there yeah. you know and uh, in fact uh, many people would get amazed that why this sarv dharm wala thing that one thing happens and every kind of puja archana everything is done hmm. in their whole system hmm. maybe that the people like us who were out of the system it may hmm. look just too peculiar maybe look like a threat or dangerous Hmm. but they are actually ingrained that way because they are dispassionate about every other thing hmm. somebody is in a particular regiment and if the war cry is that shri raja yeah. ram ki jai so everybody does it irrespective yeah. of which religion you are coming from hmm. so the to serve in army becomes a very different purpose altogether hmm. and again it's because a different perspective has been laid here hmm. what perspectives comes in the case of the general muslims is through the malwa uh, malvis molanas mm. and in fact what the teachings also comes from from the house mm. right i understand that there are problems in the book i will not deny it. there are right mm. that is why sitaram goel had done this calcutta petition project mm. right so it did happen people did recognize it but still some perspectives can lay a way right direction if perhaps some more teaching would have been happened for darashikum but that will not happen because that will never fit the bill right so, you know it's very interesting case that there is certain definition that who a muslim is hmm. because who a muslim is now who is going to define it not you not me not an ex muslim for sure right a muslim yeah. can a muslim will define better that who is a muslim and yeah. in fact only the, the the book can define that who the yeah. muslim is because 
you submit to Allah and hmm. you submit to the whole doctrine. It's very yeah. clear. Hmm. The moment you deviate from it, that so when this whole concept of the good Muslim and bad Muslim comes, that's hmm. you know very delusional because you have actually deviated from the book. The yeah. moment you do something, and uh, in the for all the practical purposes, it may look very strange to the people, but if you are born into a certain family, you mm. carry that religion. Mm. You just can't do much about it. Yeah, it's a good luck, bad luck, whatever. Past kakram, you are born in a certain family, so yeah. you that's what you are gone. So at times, if you feel that if you have become an ex-Muslim, then the problems get solved. Mm. It's not the end of the problem mm. because there will be more and more radical people around you who will yeah. not let you even live that kind of life. Yeah. So this is a very complex construct. Hmm. But the questions what you question what you raise that why the people like Dara Shiko were not taught more hmm. is that's where the answer comes at. You know, the construct is hmm. so complex that if you will so will you try to de Islamize people? Hmm. Right. If you de Islamize, then where do this mol Malvis and Molana sit into the picture? Hmm. Don't sit anywhere. And if like certain historian will have a problem that uh, if you challenge their set uh, narrative because their old old papers and the research work what they have done becomes start become null and void yeah same happens they you know a lot of researchers so maybe that they have based their current research on something it mm. will all become zero yeah the particular thesis fails mm. or it they go against it yeah so, like say people like ravish kumar have gone so far that even if they will have good intention they can't come make a comeback True. They can never make a comeback because they have set their path that way. Yeah. It's very tough to return from there. Yeah. Now, so it happens with these people too. Hmm. Right. It's just not going to happen at so much of ease. Yeah. It's a complex step. And uh, if uh, let's say, do you do? Would you say that Darashiko was not a good Muslim? Did he ever say or write anything against Islam? See, he didn't against the Islam, but mm. you know, from what perspective, mm. because as per the doctrine, mm. even if you are, you know, following the, the tenets of the polytheist, mm. you have deviated from the path. Right. And again, as far as the good and Muslim, because you are also a Muslim, if you are born in a Muslim family, mm. if I go against, and there's a way to look at someone as a Muslim based on theology. Yeah. Based on theology, he was certainly not a good Muslim, not a Muslim at all, that way, mm. based on theological, but because you understood that he's born in this family, he has yeah. not declared that I have become a Hindu or not, you know, followed that mm. path. He has not uh, chosen some other path that way. Mm. So he's still a Muslim. So mm. then it becomes very complex to even say that who is a good Muslim or a bad Muslim, right? Because the next argument comes based on what based on book, either you are Muslim or you are not a Muslim. There's no good Muslim, bad Muslim. Hmm. But based on the social construct, they yeah. can be good Muslim, bad Muslim. Yeah. So I guess uh, would you would you say therefore that would you would you support this claim that the only reason Darashiko was not highlighted or taught in our history was because he was not a good Muslim according to Islam? That's very true. Hmm. What is He's Indian not Army? A Muslim. Yeah. What is Indian Army doing right that the rest of the country apparently can't figure out, and the Indian Army has been get, getting it right for ever since the independence. Even when Maharaja uh, of Kashmir's army in, in that army, Muslims are butchering everyone else. Even then, line of Noshera goes and, and protects the country. What is Indian army doing right? Mm, I didn't get you. Can you? What is Indian army doing right that they are not facing that, that problem, which the rest of the okay. country is facing in every other organization? Okay. So, you know, again, uh, as I said, that it's all about the perspective. Hmm. So the moment you get into the army and my, based on my limited conversation with the people in the hmm. services and uh, what they have, what I get from them that the whole environment is very different. Hmm. You are as far as your Quran as a text is concerned, hmm. it's just there as the theology religion stays there. Hmm. The moment you step into your battle, the moment you are with your comrades as in the people around you, hmm. You are for the comrade, that's your family. When you are in battle, you are for your country. Hmm. Nothing else matters. Hmm. So a person will give equal effort because the camaraderie 
really comes first in an army because mm. you fight the battles together yeah right you you are seeing that uh, the, the, the someone is getting killed or something happened mm. just in front of your eyes for, with whom you spent so much of good time maybe mm. right from the period uh, of getting into the academy mm. uh, to so on and on mm. maybe you would be commissioned in the same period yeah. and also there are different kind mm. of emotions and the connections right so for them the nation and the camaraderie always comes first mm. and everything else is so metaphysical it just you know mm. some way may feel offended but mm. for them religion is always a matter of that it's to be kept there for them mm. they worship motherland the first they worship mm. the nation the first and that's the only religion for them mm. what is it that uh, makes artists prone to leftist politics more yeah so because you know i i got prone to left uh, the leftist mentality because i was into architecture right so it's the, the uh, when you get into this whole notion of the free flow of the thought hmm. and then when you begin to look into the theories behind hmm. what you do hmm. unfortunately all the best of the theories on the academic work hmm. right which will surface will be hmm. leftist hmm. because if you uh, you will have very less of a work on indian aesthetics i see you will have very less of a work which can and in fact because they are also written in the language of the past hmm. I, of course like la- do language become past because like sanskrit is also very much alive and thriving but hmm. what i mean to say that the languages which was a common mode of communication back then sanskrit pali etc hmm. right. so the the first emotion of the people itself is that say that you talk about a book called natya shastra right. right so the first thought will be natya shastra what kind of text it would be it would be hmm. so complex and maybe that's so outdated hmm. a person will find it very cool to read the works of the west hmm. about the post modernism what's hmm. exactly happening and how the synthesis of the art is happening hmm. what was art deco movement it will hmm. look very cool hmm. people will be taken aback looking at the painting of the van gogh and hmm. so many I, i i i like the paintings of van gogh too hmm. and but it doesn't mean that i will not have appreciation of the kind of the artwork which we did hmm. our artwork was certainly not abstract because we were very sorted people hmm. we knew right. exactly what we want to do yeah uh, and you know abstraction was also used as a mo- modern because it is a form of a rebellion because when you uh, when you do a rebel you do a satire or say the stand up comic at times hmm. stand up comic is a satire right hmm. you are expressing your rebel against something hmm. as uh, against system right yeah yeah and when you do that it it so happens that it will be uh coming in abstract form hmm. it will not be the direct assault because uh, but the whole indic system was so open to the ideas people expressed the things very clearly even when it came to the notion of the say kama sutra even even that was expressed so beautifully hmm. so everything was never bracketed into the brackets of uh curving the freedom of speech we were very uh we were people who supported the freedom of speech to a great extent hmm. and uh, that's the reason why there was no such concept of the abstraction hmm. everything was very practical functional so even the mathematics also what we did it was very straight cut it was not uh, you know western abstract mathematics of axioms etc it was more about that you know 2 plus 2 equal to 4 hmm. why do you want to prove 2 plus 2 equal to 4 hmm. but uh, in the western concept you will do a piano's axiom piano's axiom to prove that 2 plus 2 equal to 4 hmm. do we need it yeah would you say that in the modern world uh, art seems to be as we have learned from the west apparently at least that art seems to be only and only uh, a sort of a rebellion a, a way to stand up against the establishment whereas art in india seems to be a devotion to god a way to show your love for god yeah it it is about uh, because we see bhagwan really in and around us we see bhagwan mm. in ourselves and uh, again it's so it's so so much that we live the metaphysical and the physical life all in one go mm. right and uh, so when we express the art say when you take the dance forms almost all the dance forms are uh, about the bhakti hmm 
to devi ma to yeah. shri ram hmm. and so in a different ways it comes hmm. right but in the western construct so because we don't have the existence of the dance forms or the art forms hmm. which existed way back in the pagan era hmm. we don't see much of them exactly so it will be bit too bold to say that west didn't had it because west hmm. had the paganism hmm. it would be appropriate to say that once the institutionalization of the religion ha- religions happened hmm. with the monotheistic order hmm. it all became because when you try to form something which is very distinct and hmm. you are trying to show yourself as a distinct hmm. that's when you choose a path which will look like a rebellious path hmm. like deconstructivism as i told you that in deconstructivism even if your site is rectangular you like to do a building which is triangular in plan or shape hmm. <clears throat> though it's not needed right so the expression right away from the the, the right from the beginning hmm. was very rebellious in the nature hmm. like when the, when you hear the story of the jesus christ so jesus christ is also again many people were surprised to know but uh, in fact when marx was writing his work with angels and angels thought that christianity is very compatible with uh, communism because yeah, yeah because he course. saw that jesus was rebelling against the monarch yeah and so he said that to marx that i found it very compatible mm, of course yeah and so you see an angle of rebel even in what the most orthodox religion because christianity has an orthodox form mm. so that orthodox form is being seen as a form of communism mm. now when you look at these religions existing together say the uh, when islam got into like the byzantines and the mm. uh, islam got into battle mm. the persians later on so mm. persians also became the muslims later on and when all these wars mm. happened it was about the war of the ideas right everyone was trying to prove themselves but when in india wars happened wars were never based on that my religion or the my faith system is greater than thou yeah it was always about the territories mm. it was always about i want to expand yeah it was always about i wa- i am doing the uh, you know i want to make my territory richer mm. right with expansion and i want to expand i want to merge these people into a thing so i will get more revenue because that is a fertile land so it was all about that yeah no one came and said that hey why are you practicing vaishnavism i want to destroy yeah, yeah. yeah it was never like that yeah so they we never had the sense of a rebel right from any kind of practice it was always about uh direct emotion uh, direct emotion coming out through the art forms hmm. so they we never felt and uh, an urgency to express an art form right. which will come out as say that i am going to go against the system it was never needed right. to be like very interesting sir i uh, what i'm getting from your argument here is that therefore abrahamic faiths create such a situation that art becomes an enemy so uh, so the yeah. art therefore always be, ends up being anti state yeah and yes. therefore in in the indian situation would you say that indians were so stupid that they never rebelled against the state or was the situation always that good that we never needed art to rebel against the state when we did we were directly uh, fighting fighting against the king we were always uh, you know we uh, it's not that rebels won't have happened rebels hmm. have happened we have right. instances of it but art was never seen as a tool hmm. uh, to rebel uh, but Uh, as we go as we make a progression hmm. say uh, what happened in bhakti movement was actually that people were trying to restore the lost path hmm. lost path as in that certainly uh, the hinduism has was seeing the setbacks because the invaders hmm. there were a lot of conversions happening to uh, re- retain back the faith of the people in the tradition the hmm. bhakti movement started to appear in different hmm. forms in different ways So again we can't say that this was an abstraction when the songs were coming up songs of devotion the yeah. dohas were being written hmm. right they were direct devotion to the god they didn't right. came as an abstract poem yeah but 
they came a period say that when we were fighting the battles against the british so then if you see the mode of uh, communication uh, a mode of expression so the gandian way of expression at times was abstract hmm. but when you see the uh, like you know it is indeed an abstract idea right that you say that you know by gandhi the charkha you will win the independence or hmm. by ahimsa we will win the independence hmm. isn't it a, a it is an european idea hmm. b it is a very abstract idea hmm. because you're not even understanding that how this is going to happen hmm. that i will just say hey british just go and they will just go away right? yeah it's a very abstract vision perspective everything is so abstract hmm. but the moment you look look at the act of the revolutionaries right from when you know anushulan samiti caught into being hmm. vision was very clear that yeah we are going to hit you that's why akhalas got involved right yeah we are going to hit you and that is the only way hmm. all the programs whoever had it whether it was bhagat singh or when aurobindo were leading it or when yeah. savarkar took it over hmm. when netaji every one of them had a program yeah but 1942 the quit india movement never had a program hmm it was very abstract so the case i am trying to build for you is that whenever we were quite objective about anything or we had a faith and conviction in ourselves we didn't had this fear that you know something will go wrong with us we mm. always took a stand at the front foot and we were never playing through the abstracts mm. right we never did it because mm. you at times also use the abstract when you have certain fear that something will go wrong what if i get caught hmm what's the harm in showing this something directly right hmm. there's no harm in it right hmm. if you have a discontent against the government you can say it out you can say it loud hmm right so that's the reason why neither indian art form caught into that direction of those abstraction right or uh, and uh, Uh, also when uh, when you see of course they they would be metaphysical abstraction that how we conceptualize the temple we transform it into form of purush vastu purusha it's a form of vastu purusha the head is here and you con- abstract make a abstract out of it that way what you're trying to do is you're trying to make a metaphor hmm you pick something you try to base an architecture based on that head is going to behave like this yeah the the chest is going to behave like this the arms are like this hmm. this is i won't say abstraction but it is more like a creation of a metaphor that when you yeah. said that a human form you, you did a uh, use a metaphor to express a temple it was not hmm. other way around yeah uh, would you agree with the statement that religion is itself art it's a, it's a quote from a from my fa- favorite bengali film director uh, anjan dotto uh, yeah so religion is indeed an art hmm. i would say so because art what is an art art is something which you create and it starts pleasing people hmm. and it is something which never existed it got created right and it is a figment of imagination to start right. with hmm. and you look at any religion for that matter whether it was mohammedanism say the islam hmm. it was it is said that prophet muhammad uh heard something through and it was gabriel or jibril in mm. the islamic form whom he heard and that's where he brings the concept and he creates something which didn't exist of course the idea of religion always existed mm. this was the western society was as such which believed in the concept of the man and a book mm. there would be a man and a book mm. that's how the power, so wherever there is a man and a book that's where the power comes around that's like mm. a magnet mm. so when islam also came into being it was more about uh, a, a way to take away the power from <coughs> the powerful byzantinians mm. because the byzantinians have a man in a book mm. we also need a man in a book mm. because that's the only way you command the people mm. right there is no other way, way the the more and more people you command more and more land you get right the more and more land you get that's where your realm spreads yeah so and then so basically 
religion is happening to be a an art form which whose result is more and more land more and more you know wealth at your base hmm. now also you see there exists a work board isn't it hmm. you see that church is again predominant owner of the land yeah right so the moment you start to look at the abrahamic system hmm. you will find that they were always behind the land hmm. and it was basically a creation of an art hmm. to grab more and more land hmm. right. the more land the more the power right. in the contrast if you see the hindu system hmm. everybody has some sort of share in the mandir hmm. so everyone felt the ownership there yeah king never said or raja never said that hey it's my temple and it doesn't belong to you yeah though he built it hmm and of course he had to he had dharma because he took the taxes yeah right so everything was so interconnected that way hmm. and we never had this concept that you know uh, the the the, the hind this is the land because there was a time when only hinduism existed yeah So yeah, suddenly religion is an art form. There is more than add to it. Right. And uh, do you have more time? Can Can I ask more questions? Yeah, yeah, please, sure. Okay. So, what were some of your views as a leftist that today, looking back, you think, oh my God, what What was that stuff I believed in? Did you have some <laughs> wacky ideas? Yeah, one thing was sure that I looked upon the Hindu traditions as a very, uh, with a lot of disdain. I never liked mm. it. Yeah. And uh, I could never imagine that. Uh, someone would be adding a uh, talking about the idea of the gravitation long back i never thought that someone named bhaskara charya would uh, do this uh, whole uh, series of the poem just to solve a uh, the uh, just to solve a case of a calendar related to the marriage of uh, his daughter hmm. and to just to make his daughter remember the dates and everything he will formulate the mathematics and all the whole of the mathematics will be written into a poem hmm. like leelavati so hmm. i could never imagine that back then these dhoti wearing people but hmm. i'm just saying that uh, from my own perspective back then that yeah yeah if someone is wearing a dhoti and hmm. uh, it's a very a super a superstitious guy what kind hmm. of obnoxious person he is i had all kind of ugly thoughts about them hmm. but it's so interesting that i stand one degree opposite to it hmm. like uh, diametrically i have completely come opposite the way to think about it yeah. and now i think that what kind of orthodox and dogmatic people the marxists are yeah yeah because you know marx said something and you want to apply that he said something back there in europe and you want to apply it sitting here somewhere in kerala or bengal it doesn't hmm. work that way yeah and uh, what about your leftist friend circle uh so eventually uh, i was not surrounded by a lot of leftist friends that way okay because perhaps i was the only person who was political oh okay <laughs> yeah so it it would so happen that architecture school uh, is full of a people who have uh, who hate to be in uh, politics they will say mm. that they are not very related to politics but you can understand from the ideas that somehow everyone agreed to exactly uh, we with a common minimum program right. of understanding that you know hinduism is a religion which gives you the casteism yeah. and the casteism is a thing which is the root of the racism yeah right so all the worst thing which has happened to the world is because of the hinduism so these were very common minimum program which we all shared yeah so yeah there are a lot of friends who are very happy and hmm. even many would be surprised to know that they are friends my friends from bengal hmm. who are very happy to see my transition hmm. right they in fact they were a lot more right so called right than i see uh, many people who would think that if you come from bengal then uh, you will be by default a leftist right yeah. or if you are coming from K- kerala you ha- you will be a leftist yeah right but i was so lucky to have so many bengali friends and mm. most of them were so much pro tradition i see and in fact what they said back then 
did hurt me that you know what you are saying what kind of rubbish and all i see so and uh, so but, but the other friends who were on the other side who were mm. all in pro to me i am sure that i'm not in much in touch with many of them but if they would be reading my social media post i don't know what what kind of churn happens in their stomach what they feel back uh, yeah. reading those stuff yeah yeah and uh, what what are your views on uh, sati and casteism the the most hated aspects of hinduism yeah. how much there so, is of evidence i do you think so you know there is not much so again i have a very clear conviction about one thing that if there is a talk around something it's like a smoke and there must be some fire hmm i won't say that our india was one of very perfect land that would hmm. be a bit too utopian to say hmm but i certainly have a clear conviction for this too it was way better than any other places on the earth hmm whatever may the reason be hmm so just if we pick that angle of the casteism first and because the casteism before casteism people talk about slavery hmm so when the greeks came to india after alexander so they write in the book that they find india to be such a strange land hmm because indians don't keep anybody slave hmm this is the primary source a historical document hmm now the people who want to make our society as one of the most worst society what hmm. they do is that they will pick the religious text hmm right start pinpointing from that hmm they are the people who are deniers to who will say that you know this text may be having a different interpretation yeah right so but we have to understand one thing we are talking about the era 2000 years back hmm. 3000 years back hmm society was very different hmm what were the moral order of 3000 years back may not be the same 1000 years back yeah and it necessarily may not be same as 2000 years back yeah so it would be very unwise to judge those people our ancestors hmm based on the moral conduct of today right that's for sure hmm. but it doesn't it does not also take away that there would be something which should certainly not fit into a time of now hmm it cannot be we as society even despite being the greatest of civilization wouldn't have produced such golden universal thing which will keep on running 50000 a lakh of years and wo chalta hi rahega aisa nahi ho sakta hmm so the sanatan itself exists because it keeps evolving hmm anything which doesn't evolve will not exist it will get frozen yeah it will become like a dinosaurus yeah well what has happened with the abrahamic system hmm the same thing yeah and it's by the act of the people who 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 take up the thing that you know it's not that recently a, a gangster uh, who happened to be born in a hindu family hmm. uska encounter hua and no one give a damn that why hmm. you know why this and that all those things no one give give a damn to it hmm. right yeah anything may happen you will see a criminal as a criminal but we right. two three examples before hmm. it right yeah. so what has happened that certain people have still got frozen into dinosaurus ages Hmm. they're still not able to come out of it hmm. and that is what not happens with the hindu system hmm. so as far as the casteism is concerned i won't deny that there was completely a very utopian thing that maybe the discrimination won't have happened hmm. there would have happened hmm. i can't deny it hmm. i can't question the lived experience of the people because if i have to be the one to say that as a hua ya nahi hua i have to go back using a time machine and say that what happened hmm. all what i see the beautiful thing in about the hinduism is that we are the people who say that you know even if it would have happened hmm. we reject it we are not going to do atrocity based on caste on anybody no we yeah. are not going to accept it hmm. this absolute no 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 it just can't happen hmm. and at the same time if some discrimination happens against say somebody who comes from xyz caste and that is being recognized as low caste for example hmm. then that is absolutely wrong if someone is doing the same thing against say the brahmins hmm. that again falls to be a absolutely wrong construct you just can't do any kind of discrimination against exactly. anything and yeah. there cannot be a concept of retrospection hmm 
right? right? I want to go back and, you know, because you did this, so, you know, maybe 3,000 years back, your ancestor did this, so I will do this. Because you first don't have evidence to prove that, yes, I will. Religious books, if you're saying that you are not ready to believe in history of Sri Ram, but you are ready to believe in the activities of that period based on that text, that's hilarious of you because either you have to then accept the historicity of Sri Ram too. Yeah. Because you're taking those texts to base your argument that casteism was that bad. Hmm. Right. So then you have to believe in the historicity of these people. You have to believe in the historicity of Manu. Hmm. Right. So we cannot have that. Uh, I will say this as well. I will not accept your historicity as any over. Hmm. It cannot work that way. Hmm. And because we have the evidences from the uh, handwritten account of people like the Greeks, uh, like I was saying that they will say that even slavery doesn't exist. Hmm. So India certainly was a way of better place than the people whom we see as the founding fathers of the modern thought, say the Westerners. Hmm. Right. Yeah. And as far as the Sati is concerned, again, the numbers were quite exaggerated hmm. because uh, when this whole thing of uh, uh, Rajana Mohan Rai also comes up. Mm-hmm. It's very much nuanced because I have a stand because I was once a very outright critic of Rajana Mohan Rai. Okay. So, I, I because, see, even you as a person keep on involving, you get mm-hmm. into the nuances, you understand. Mm-hmm. And understanding what I got that, yes, maybe that he was working hand in hand with British, I don't know. I mm-hmm. can't prove. Mm-hmm. Because certain documents cannot exactly tell you that what nuances were of that period. Yeah. What I get to know that Hinduism was in a lot of bad shape back then. Hmm. With the young Bengal movement like the Abdirazio and all. Hmm. A lot had happened. Hmm. In fact, there was a period when the students of Presidency College hmm. would carry the beef in the thing and just to prove that we are advanced. So I'm just giving you instances that what were happening yeah. through Hinduism. And Hinduism was almost dead. So hmm. Everyone was trying to make their own mechanism that what best we can do. Yeah. But having said that, as far as the Sati is concerned, the documents were certainly first. Okay. There were not as many instances as numbers were put across. I see. How suddenly the numbers will go up hmm. in a year or two, three years was the statistics which was put across when William Bentick finally takes a thing that I'm going to do this and all. And the, their mm. scriptures, or rather the text, Hindu text, which says that you are not supposed to do, you know, this is not supposed to happen. Mm. The Vedas talk about it. There are many, many texts which goes very anti of Sati. And in this, the most seminal work which has been done on Sati is the work of Minakshi Janji. Right. And which exposes this whole narrative. That mm. It has always been that, like, me and Kushal did a podcast that is... Casteism unique to Hinduism. Yeah. I saw that and then did an entire live stream on the papers you discussed. Okay. Casteism okay. in Buddhism. Yeah. So we wanted to go further and pick on each and every religion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but eventually the times didn't work, but, but we hmm. wish to do it in future sometime. Okay. So, you know, it's not unique to, it was more of a social construct that there was hierarchy which existed. Hmm. The system was as such that even you look at Egypt, it was also like that. Right. There was no difference. And there are many people who come up with the argument that, you know, uh, the conversions didn't happen only because of the caste. Hmm. So, you know, Egypt also had this construct. Yeah. They had this pyramid. Yeah. There are many other, Persia also had it. Hmm. They got converted. So, yeah. all these arguments which the people of today want to base based on their political agendas. Hmm. This way, that way, or ultra trad or neo trad or whatever. There are many times. I don't know where I do stand, but hmm. I'm just saying you that this does happen. Hmm. That they will just try to buttress their argument based on a certain perspective. Hmm. But they don't see that, you know, there can be a counter argument to it too. And they will not be ready to engage with you. Hmm. Right? Because history or the the story of the past owes to none of us, right? Hmm. I'm ready to say that I was wrong. If I'm proven wrong, because what do I have to do if something happened? Because 
we have to say it the way it is because the history of that period only mm. owes to the great people who lived and in that period mm. and to that time it doesn't mm. owes to you not to me not so we have no right to do anything wrong with history right was was sati consensual because uh, the leftists say that w- women were being dragged into the funeral pyre and savarkar is writing in event after event that the in laws are saying that no no don't do this don't do this but the custom and tradition is such that and she feels devoted to her recently passed away husband that she jumps into the sati anyway yeah so you know there was never any such forced invocation of sati as such as per the historical record acha so we have uh, because sati first of all was always because has it been such a historical incidence or had it been something a sort of a prescription of the hinduism hmm. we should have found the evidence in the text hmm. there should be a lot of support to it hmm. because you do the most of the halabalu are around two things one is sati second hmm. is casteism hmm. right so like how you bring the documents for the casteism that hmm. also is at bit too exaggerated so hmm. again as i said that you know i neither i will deny that everything was golden nor i will deny that you know it was that bad as people want to show it as it was certainly not that bad hmm right and uh, what someone is asking you why babar was bi- bisexual is an issue <laughs> the issue should be what he did to bharat did you make it an issue uh, yeah i have made it an issue because okay. this is a one entire chapter around it because okay. this is important hmm because see uh now people make uh, idealize babar isn't it hmm. they do idealize right so now if you idealize someone then the question comes to you that you know what's the reason that you are idealizing him that's yeah or somebody say kumar shanu is an idol hmm so the question would be that ha bhai what happened that i understand that you have got interest in singing hmm. then why not you know uh Udit Narayan, why Kumar Shanu? Right. So you will have your valid arguments. This and this. Yeah. So the now the argument goes back to the people who may want to make idol of the Babar. That what are the characters hmm. which made you happy about Babar? Good. Now what Good. are the characters, the features of Babar? A. He was a a very good poet. Okay. B. He was a uh certainly uh islamist okay see he was he loved his family a lot i see d he was um, uh certainly very uh he was bisexual right okay e he was alcoholic i see right now these are five major characters which come out hmm. about babar when you read about him okay Now, if you are making an idol out of him, so of course you have to choose something positive. Hmm. Now, let's pick one by one. Now, the first thing he was a good poet. Hmm. He was not that great of a poet, and Mirza Ghalib that he will say that hey, yeah, Babar is my idol. Hmm. And most of the people who will, <laughs> who will, who are making idol out of Babar, who are idolizing it, maybe they will not even know that Babar wrote poems. Hmm. so that's even out of question yeah then second thing which arises is that he loved his family a lot he cared for his family who doesn't care for their family and mm. of course if you in general like mm-hmm. there would be exceptions yeah. yeah but everybody had so even that is not going to inspire you so much and make an idol of something that you already would have other chacha chachi and many other people around you who would be loving their family so much it is not so exceptional right yeah third thing alcoholic now it's kufr in islam right mm. fourth bisexual again mm. it kufr in islam mm. yeah so if you are uh, bisexual or homosexual you are supposed to be thrown from the terrace yeah right. now the only thing what is left is the islamic character where he destroys the temple mm. he destroys he kills the hindus he takes the title of ghazi he compares himself with ghazni and gori mm. so does it mean that people want to idolize him only for this trait as i told you that if you do five kufr but you do one thing for the greater right. cause of the islam hmm. so this is actually was a very important point to bring around that his alcoholic trait is the, because 
this is posing question to the people who idolize babar hmm and that see the whole point is that again i have got two agendas one agenda is to do an objective biography so because he was bisexual so it has to come out hmm i can't hide it hmm second part is that i also have this agenda that you know i have to really show the invaders as they were hmm as in i am pretty convinced in my personal opinion reading babar that he was a islamist and he wanted because he compared himself with ghazni and gori hmm. he doesn't talks about khilji he doesn't talks about anybody but hmm. the two worst of the idol breakers ghazni and gori hmm. so you know his inspiration yeah even inspired by taimur too because he wanted to fulfill the dream of taimur hmm. so if that is already established i want to pose this question to the people that why do you want to idolize him hmm. which is very important to be answered hmm. that you know and if you just talk about what they he did to us it will become a pamphlet hmm. i can do a 150 page book on babar and done so right. but you know it's not impo- that it's not a historiography hmm. what i am doing i'm doing a pamphlet writing for a certain political agenda yeah because if my book already covers that what wrong babar has done hmm. how does it really matter if it even says that what babar ate today hmm i'm just saying right exactly how does it really matter that how he is you know fighting with the snow to get into hindustan hmm does it really matter to the people if it has been brought in there and will it really harm this whole project of really bringing the true history it it is not doing but actually it is actually bringing history as it is hmm. we will not commit the mistake what the likes of audrey tuski have done a hmm. pamphlet right their books can never qualify as a history book because it's it's writing everything just in a ye uh, in the praise of those people right hmm. so right. this cannot be a historical project hmm. and uh, yeah go ahead and we, and the point is that i want to snatch away the narrative hmm. from those pamphlet years hmm. and when i'm snatching away the narrative when narrative lies among us we have to hmm. do the job at, like how the jinnah sarkar did of course i am not trying to compare myself with one of the greatest hmm. historian who has hmm. lived on this planet earth in my eyes but hmm. i'm just saying that we have to work on the model he showed us hmm. not on the model what audrey tuske works on which is still hmm. a different tinge right uh, someone is asking you uh, wait where did the was he tolerant to other bisexuals or did he follow sharia uh sharia there as in removing other gays bisexuals but except himself was in uh, but he was himself one in secret life no he never has shown any kind of emotions against any other bisexual uh, mm. there is one other just one more instance where it has been recorded in babar nama where in samarkand one revolt has happened because one of his cousin is found engaged with the son of a very powerful noble man so mm. the samarkandis have revolted against uh, the power hmm. and that's the only thing but we don't know how actually treated the homosexuals or the bisexuals we have no clarity about it okay uh, someone is asking you percentage wise if you had to rate how right and wrong how right or wrong dr ambedkar was about muslims and the intrinsically islamic nature of the muslim identity since he was the solely the harshest and most honest critic of islam in his time so uh, no there were other critics too of hmm. islam and but what dr ambedkar did he produced a magnum opus hmm. which was pakistan or the thoughts on pakistan or hmm. pakistan or partition of india hmm. which covered the whole political islam because it was exactly happening in that period yeah so he expressed exactly how it was hmm. and uh, you know what happens that a lot of people take a offense when you talk about dr ambedkar hmm. right that why you are quoting him hmm. so again when you are in in midst of the cultural wars if mm. it exists mm. right if it exists because uh, right if you then you are not going to let the best of the weapons or say the best of the props go to your enemies mm. whatever right so mm. if you are saying it's a cultural war mm. so when i completely am aware that dr ambedkar said a lot of very bad things about hindus too hmm. and uh, 
while it will be very tough to see him as a ally of hindus or not because again it's not even of my interest to analyze that whether somebody was a ally of hinduism or not hmm. but what really comes out as an interest is the thought provoking ideas which he brought about the socio political construct of that period hmm. had it not do dr uh, savarkar criticized dr ambedkar hmm. too but at many places they fell in one line yeah a lot of issues they exchanged lot of letters of praise for each other hmm. many times yeah and so it means that you know if the man who has established the whole idea of the uh, the po- political hindutva or the hindutva how he perceived it as hmm. if he has chosen to see dr ambedkar as an ally right so there is no harm in choosing the thoughts or the work hmm. what he did to really expose the problems of the politics of that time which was being posed by the political islam hmm. and you know what is very interesting that because dr ambedkar becomes uh, one of the very uh, one of the figure which no one wants to say a word about because of how the political construct takes this yeah. how the laws and the rules and regulations are hmm. but irrespective of that the same people who you know pray are favor, would favor the taliban who would favor the islamist who will favor everybody hmm. everything which is anti hindu hmm. will always keep quoting dr ambedkar yeah against hinduism yeah and then you say that you oh, oh, okay i am not going to talk about dr ambedkar hmm. for his works on uh, islam hmm. then good for them not good for you yeah there is no problem because they will keep talking what dr and dr ambedkar has a uh, has an image has mm. that icon uh, is that icon that we respect to what you say what i say what anybody says is image and icon will remain right. as at least for few more decades to come i, I don't yeah. know till when yeah so you know why to get put up about these things yeah. and his criticism was really very harsh in fact he was more radical uh, uh, against uh, islam and the muslims than savarkar Yeah. Savarkar wanted them to be accommodated into a kind of Bharat. He didn't. Yeah. He called Savarkar proposition as a very irrational proposition. Mm. Uh, proposition where he says that they need to stay here. Mm. Uh, Savarkar says that I understand that there are two countries, but the two countries can stay together. Ambedkar says that what he's saying it just can't happen. Mm. Sir, someone is asking you: Did Babur's Turkey clan treat homosexuality as haram? Did Babur use alcohol to cope with his potentially illicit relationships? no uh, we don't know much about his illicit relationships uh, uh, through babar nama we mm-hmm. don't have much idea except for the babri incidents okay. babri was a boy whom he was seeing okay and uh, he consumed alcohol not for this but uh, he got dragged into alcohol by his uh, friends and the cousins okay. in one of the parties okay. where he's forced to drink and he's very really, yeah and is very guilty uh, that time that oh i am feeling so bad that uh, uh, i am i have begun to take alcohol and all is so so uh, you can sense the guilt while you read it mm. and uh, alcohol was more under the peer pressure but after certain period he becomes a proper bevda as in <laughs> he drinks a lot mm. and <laughs> so uh, not much of, uh, we know about that oh, oh, anything more than that okay sir do you uh, agree with this idea of reparations do hindus deserve uh, reparations from muslim for all the jizya we have paid and apparently akbar taking our money and sending it to saudi arabia you know it's uh, becomes very uh, it's a very uh, the first thing which should happen like you know uh, reparations and all are a very notional thing and we never know that what it means that it's very tough to really retrospect and analyze that what we lost and when you can't even analyze that hmm. just imagine that so many tens of hundreds of uh, the brave rajput princes the queens etc go into the fire on the day of the holi ka dahan and burn themselves right and hmm. with the kangan in a hand and hmm. the jawhar shaka happens hmm. so it's you can talk about the money which went there right. but so much we lost 
it was when dr nepal says that it's a wounded civilization so hmm. it's so badly wounded hmm. what are we going to do with it it's just impossible to get it back but you will always have a sense of peace when acknowledgement starts coming hmm. when it is the truth is accepted as it was there is no going forward without the truth and reconciliation hmm it's still why you know hindus are so so again not because i am hindu but hindus are so good people in that sense that you know they want to walk hand in hand with everybody hmm, hmm. they don't have any qualms that you know not many people are even aware about what happened in the past but hmm. those who are even aware that whether you it's a workforce or whatever it's very uh, it's a very, very good community that way hmm. but the the community which has been so good to you and then you decide that there were certain bunch of people who had been spitting on uh, the, the the shivlinga and kashi hmm. they knew it hmm i thought that they didn't do it they wanted to make it a fountain what not hmm right so you they have not been able to come in terms with the the past hmm a lot of people try to justify what they are today by not acknowledging the truth hmm because it puts you in a uh, spot hmm it puts your ancestor into the spot that what had gone wrong why you had to do it hmm. but the whole point is that you know no one actually is much worried that no one wants to put anybody in the spot hmm. but what acknowledgement will do is that it will start building the concept of amenity the concept of amenity or the unity can't be built on the further the foundation which is a false one hmm. you can't have a foundation where it looks like a raft which is 3 meter deep and in that you have just got 50 mm 50 mm pcc the poor thin thin concrete and in that you have filled it with some dust and something it can't be it can't be built on a false raft foundation hmm. it has to be a solid foundation hmm. and the solid foundation will be a needs to be a truthful one hmm. these acknowledgement need to come hmm. the society need to come forward and say that you know we don't have a problem i know that the temples were broken and we feel mm. bad that why the masjid exists there we mm. feel bad about it we shouldn't mm. and the day this kind of movement will start happening mm. the clock will start ticking in a different way mm. as in why we see the clock the clock ticking more in direction of more of a divisions coming in a day mm. we start ticking in a different way mm. but this acknowledgement needs to come from there and i do say it very clearly that the responsibility actually lies on that side because hmm the thing happened there and hmm. people would have forgotten but still there are the leaders who go on to the you know tomb of the orangjeb hmm. right still somebody praises orangjeb still hmm. you are not ready to leave that mosque which was the the temple over which half of the mosque was created to humiliate the hindus you are trying to acknowledge that oh alamgir orangjeb was correct Hmm. The moment you say that, you know, we are not happy to give it away. We are acknowledging that the temple which was destroyed by Jah- Jahanpana Akbar was correct. Hmm. So these not acknowledgement of the truth or not giving away the places, this reflects to a broader problem. Not just that you are worried about your emotional connect to the place that you have been offering namaz. It's something else. Hmm. Sir. how does truth and reconciliation happen does it happen with five people from each side in a, in a closed room because nelson mandela did that and today even atrocities against white people are going on in south africa a, a, the entire african continent is as screwed up as it was before yeah and that kind of truth and reconciliation may not be a very rational one hmm. but somewhere we need to start hmm. and the start can start happening like i was very happy when irfan abi came in front i hmm. think it's around a month back or so hmm. he said that you know it cannot be denied that kashi and mathura temples were destroyed by orangje hmm while there can be some historians from jnu every day fighting so hard to make yeah uh, case otherwise we had a question about one such person actually uh, the question was that what do you think of that person that her accusation that you don't know farsi 
so it's you know this is so fragile and so in this unimportant because hmm. see there are two things into it either i know farsi or i don't know farsi hmm. but it is so inconsequential whether abhas knows farsi or not or she doesn't knows farsi or not hmm. what is becoming consequential is the the information what we are bringing to the table hmm. it is about you know your conviction or how suitable you are to talk about the subject will speak aloud through your works hmm. will speak aloud not to appeal you know please watch my videos and blah blah hmm. right it can only happen when you know you have logical argument not because a particular historian had said something wo brahm lakir ho gaya nahi you have to analyze it hmm. you don't have a triangulation method you are not triangulate triangulating it hmm. so whether i know farsi or not it can be better judged by reading my work are they saying that uh, since you don't know farsi apparently therefore you translated and therefore misrepresented babar they may say it hmm. they may say it but again can they prove that trace translate a bit and say me that how i am wrong hmm. right so you know when the instance again because we always get the names to great people so i'm not trying to compare myself with those great shoulders but hmm. uh, case lalwar once accused of this fact that uh you know he uh, wrote a book where he represented that around 80 million uh, population was lost between 15 1080 mm-hmm. to 1500 yeah now irfan habib did a polemic of his thing mm-hmm. and uh, it was more of argument that he this this that case law repeated it it's been around 50 years five decades case mm. lal is no more with us mm. that rebuttal is st- still not replied though ifan is very much alive mm. so you know you can do everything what you do in your capacities but well, neither if you want to counter a literature which mm. is coming on the part of being a non fiction mm. you have to do a counter literature to it right you have to mm. critic it yeah it will not matter that it will be proven through your works it will be proven through the literature what you produce if you are a historian write the books who stopped you to do it hmm. was babar a first generation muslim no 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 okay you must have not so sir getting back to uh, truth and reconciliation how how does india do it or are we in the middle of truth and reconciliation basically ye thoda thoda consternation thoda confrontation gali dena chalega that is the truth and reconciliation that that's that has to happen ground up yeah perhaps we are through the phase of hmm true not too but we are being through the path of the truth and reconciliation hmm. and it's happening because these people are acknowledging it yeah and say that what happened in 1992 hmm again i start from 1992 because it is so a lot of times a question arises that was it very hindu what was done hmm or was it really in our nature to do something like that mm-hmm. but then the counter question comes to me that given how the constitutional setup has been set up and that the period what 1992 was when people had now begun to really look beyond the job and trying to establish themselves because the economy had begun to change a bit mm-hmm. right so like i remember my father's one very important thing was that he wanted to secure job because everything else will follow but the priority was a good job because india was certainly not a very rich country back then hmm. and no uh, one cared yeah yeah go ahead no no one cared that what's written in much in the law hmm. so had that instance not happened hmm. would people who would have woken that much hmm or people would have begun to think about that we need to get back other temples hmm. so maybe that when we say that we would have let it happen the way it was so aren't we again going back to the gandhian way what we criticize at times hmm. because but again these are the questions which can never be answered so aptly yeah. it, 
it, it can, I don't know whether what happened on 6 December 1992 was right or wrong. I hmm. practically don't know. Hmm. But what that did was first a series of riots began to happen. Hmm. And when the riots happened, uh, after that, the bomb blast happened in Bombay Blast, we know, hmm. of 1993. Hmm. Now, remember when the first uh, Allahabad High Court judgment came hmm. before the Supreme Court thing uh, in 2010 or 11, around that period, nothing happened anywhere. Hmm. In fact, when the Supreme Court's final judgment came, nothing happened any, anywhere yeah. except on, in the TV debate studios. Yeah. Right. Nothing happened anywhere else. So, it kind of gives you a point of view that hmm. Maybe that people were not very much in terms with the truth way back in 1992. Hmm. But people have begun to accept it, at least notionally. Right. So, so, weren't some people on the Muslim side already ready to accept it? But they, the, the kind of, the, the peace yeah. talks were basically derailed by Marxist historians, actually. Yeah. yeah, actually, it was all decided and the temple was going to come back. Hmm. And uh, so the Marxist historian, the the whole Jamaat of the AMU historians, hmm. they came and said that, oh, hey, you have got a case and we will fight the case for you. Hmm. And interestingly, there was no case and they were just trying to suffice the requirement of cultural Marxism and intersectionality where oppressed is always oppressed. And hmm. you have to do whatever you do, you have to do for the oppressed. Hmm. Yeah. You can't do it for the oppressive. Yeah. Someone is saying counter literature should be historical and peer reviewed, not like creating fake characters like Rampiari Gujari and Suhail Dev. No, see, Rampiari, again, because I have not researched much into, much into this character, so hmm. I will not comment on them. Hmm. Because I, being a student of history, I am certainly a student of history because I read history. Hmm. People may not like it, hmm. but I do. Hmm. So, so, based on that, I cannot confirm whether they existed or not but uh, and that's exactly was my point when i said that i will not shy off to show the good traits of the barber too hmm. because when you're picking up the biography you have to stand by the truth hmm. and but there are two parts into it one is about the narrative building too hmm. so there can be at times stories which can really inspire you a lot hmm. without really damaging the, the part of the historiography too. Hmm. Because if you go back and look at the history of what is being taught in say Britain, they hmm. don't talk about 1857. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's not that they are unscientific country. Hmm. It's not that they are non secular country. They're hmm. secular. Though yeah. the people from the church do hmm. sit in the parliament too. Yeah. So it's very, uh, so this, as far as this part of the narrative building is concerned, there would be a lot of folklores. There would be mm. a lot of oral traditions too. Right. Which, and when we look back at our own historiography, which what we call the Itihasa. Mm. Itihas was not a typical postmodern non-fiction book writing as I'm doing right now. Right. It was more about uh, trying to give the updesh, the moral, mm. because Itihasa's purpose was like that. Hmm. Like when you pick the Ramayan, right? Ramayan, then one can say that the poet, the great Valmiki, would have taken a liberty of uh, uh, the imagination too hmm. while he was building. But certainly the instance happened on a broad spectrum of incidences. Something was conceptualized hmm. and said that it happened that way. There would hmm. be a lot of metaphors. Hmm. It may not be exactly the way it has been written. There might be some exaggeration, hmm. but the mood point or the code point of the whole story hmm. certainly would have been historic. Right. We are discussing something. We say that we had a topic to discuss. Maybe that the third person who heard it hmm. would make a minutes of our meeting, would hmm. lay down 10 points, and then it goes back to say his sister or brother. Hmm. Right. And he says that I heard from my brother and he narrates this yeah. story. So it's a truth that we both spoke. It's mm. true that we spoke on these certain five key points. Mm. And that's the core that we had a discussion around it. But I said that just a second back, we had a discussion around it. And somebody says that, Abha said that, yeah. they discuss around it. 
so it doesn't really matter but the core of the whole thing remains intact hmm. so indian historiography or itihas likhan was all about the upadesham hmm. but when we are picking the narratives building in my case when i am writing about the invaders hmm. it become a surgent and important and pertinent to write it in a post modern non fiction style hmm. because already the narrative status about them yeah are the writers in those format yeah you have to counter those lies through the same tool yeah so both needs to exist but certainly not in the places where they have already built the narrative in mm. that you cannot go into build a uh, get into this oral traditions and yeah you, uh, yeah this was actually my second last question that uh, what what would you say is the importance of history how should it be taught uh, how, how much history of this this gory insane adult history do we can we teach to kids and therefore shouldn't a kids history up until let's say class 10 at least should be just about glorifying our past and then if you want to really get into history as a, as a professional then you can get into real hard stuff so you know i have a different opinion around okay. it because what i feel is that the best warriors know themselves the as much as they know their enemies mm. and by the time you have stepped out of the standard 10 mm. you have already chosen your stream whether you are yeah. going to be with science or mm. you're going to exist with the commerce or you're going to pursue in humanities right mm. so and the foundation is already set yeah and like and when this foundation is already set and then when you come out say that you are in mid of your 30s hmm. and then you realize that you know maybe then you are facing some ambiguous situation hmm. you don't know that whether akbar was really great or not yeah then you just try and that's the point where you felt trapped to a lot of whatsapp universities too hmm. because when you are trying to say that you are living with the agenda that you have to glorify your past maybe mm. that you will fall to any blog which will look like akbar look very ugly mm. maybe the story would be coming from any form mm. right you will just like to pick it and circulate it over the whatsapp that you know this is the truth of akbar and that's mm. how you will do it mm. so but if the foundations are already set right Hmm. that you know exactly that how the things were at least in a summarized form hmm. so you will never fell prey to uh, the whatsapp universities in any other form irrespective hmm. of whether you are trying to uh, criticize india or you are trying to glorify india hmm. right so right. we need to bring it uh, quite early and hmm. earlier the person gets to know about the past both the dark and the bright the better it is Hmm. Someone is asking you. A uh, few years ago, Abbas ji talked about one musician of Arabia who came in Samrat Vikramaditya's period to learn theology and music. Uh, who was he? So basically, we don't have much of information about that musician. Okay. So in fact, I was corrected by somebody that we don't have much of uh, information around it. It's all comes from hearsay and the discussions around it. Hmm. And um, I did accept it, and uh, that is how I. I have learned about it and it was uh the handle of true indology which corrected me and okay. i took it because yeah hmm. uh sir uh, can you give like four five points uh, how to reform humanities this is one of the recurring topics of our channel okay both in school level and and university level phd how to improve how to reform humanities Re- education so that only anti india or anti hindu elements don't seem to be churned out repeatedly year after year so it can happen in only few ways uh, we have mm. to be very focused on that direction and mm. those direction my opinion is uh, going to the history exactly through the original source and for that Be, it it can start with the translated version may not be exactly in the in the original language but people should go back to that and uh, humanities especially the subject which gives you the scope to go back to the primary sources hmm. and uh, we surely need to be very dispassionate about what we are reading hmm. because if you get if you get passionate about something you may fall trap to the biases uh, of hmm. course i will not say that i am 
completely unbiased hmm. biases do work with you hmm. but your biases should not affect your uh when you're trying to pursue the truth hmm. when you're trying to pursue truth you should be ready to accept that hey i was wrong here and i need to move forward with the truth which has come to me hmm. right even if it is discomfortable hmm. even if it is going giving you discomfort you should be ready to accept it hmm. third thing is that we all need to be very much uh, conscious about the narratives which are building out of india hmm. because a lot of things do happen in the universities abroad they hmm. bring a lot of academic books which should be published through oxford publication right hmm. which should come to the cambridge press right and which should be high class academic work and uh, while we are doing bjp congress and all those kind of things mm. the lot of literature which have been produced outside india in those universities which certainly are based in the format of the cultural marxism and of that india falls to be in the set of the oppressor forget everything else forget the religions india itself falls in the set mm. of the oppressor mm. so india will always be shown in some of the worst of the light mm. so those literature will keep on popping in mm. and at the same time it's very important that uh, if we want to really progress in humanities though i the first thing i said that uh, we should uh, go back to the primary source even if it is translated but in the due course we should start learning some languages of the past mm. right one should know that how pali how to read pali one should know that how to read sanskrit mm. one should know farsi mm. right it becomes very important if you want to deal with the subject if you are very serious about it and once these things are fixed and once your aim is just to get the knowledge you are not worried about that whether this knowledge bank is going to harm my own narrative i am ready to change my own narrative if the truth comes this way you will start to make the humanities as a better subject by default it will not need much of a push from anywhere and now uh, with uh, the time a lot of financial models are also coming up where the researchers are going to be uh, supported the, mm. like i was fellow of the rcs foundation which mm. is run by asha jadeja motwani ji mm. so it was mentored by vikram sampath and now uh, under the guidance of vikram sampath uh, he and i have uh, Uh, began a new foundation which is called foundation for fiscr foundation for indian historical and cultural mm-hmm. research yeah yeah where we aim to uh, nurture a lot of people produce um, uh, get the fellows on board mm-hmm. uh, go back to the original manuscript translate bring the books right mm-hmm. so uh, a lot is happening the f- and i'm sure that with this uh, uh, new idea where everyone wants to do something for the indic right mm-hmm. right now ola has brought a uh, ai yeah. yeah yeah so the people the entrepreneurs the the big people with money who mm. are the capitalists who are actually the makers of the system in general mm. right who run the country that way right because they uh, churn the employment for us mm. and so they are very much interested to do something for the country because mm. and as many people say it is one of the best time to live in india yeah for many reasons Yeah. and of the among those reasons is that everyone is really interested to push for anything which will be pro india or which will be pro uh, dharma that way mm. so yeah we have the paths open mm. so last question it's sort of my personal curiosity is it true that akbar's skeleton was fed to dogs by raja ram jat and and some of some of the bones were burnt and some of it, some of it was fed to dogs yeah that is what the story comes as and this certainly has the sources for it that's the i oh my god that, that's a bad legacy bad way to end uh, and so so when is bower 2 coming out expected next year early month or so okay. so let's see i'm in i'm some days due to submit my manuscript oh let's see I how see. it shapes up i see so thank you sir thank you very much for for giving so much time to our podcast my pleasure it was really pleasure talking to you thank, thank you, sir. you we we got into many unexpected uh, realms and zones of conversation as well this only happens when people give so much time to a podcast people keep telling me do podcasts in in 1 hour or 30 minutes good conversations don't happen within 30 minutes or 1 hour especially when when it's with a person you don't know 
true true I agree thank you sir thank you sir good night it is a good night good night guys thank